The subcommittee will come to order. Let me welcome everyone today to the Labor HHS Education Appropriations Subcommittee for our annual Public Witness Day. I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Congressman Molinar, Congressman Klein, uh, who I understand are um, uh, Congressman Molinar, uh, uh, they're both on and are, are listening. Um, let me um, uh, begin by expressing really our sincere gratitude and appreciation uh, to all of our witnesses, both the witnesses in attendance today and the ones who are submitting written testimony for the record. Thank you. Thank you so much for your hard work on behalf of millions of Americans who benefit from programs funded through our bill. This afternoon, we will hear from 23 witnesses covering all aspects of this subcommittee's jurisdiction. It's actually this morning. So uh, as we will hear today, the programs in the Labor HHS Education Bill equip our nation to deal with public health emergencies. They fund life-saving biomedical research. They level the playing field for low-income children looking to get a good education. They help Americans get the skills that they need to find a job as the country recovers from simultaneous public health and economic crises. I am pleased to say that the Biden-Harris administration recognizes the importance of these programs. While the president's full budget for fiscal year 2022 will be released next week on May 27th, we know the president is proposing strong investments in the programs we will be discussing today. The Department of Education, $103 billion, an increase of $30 billion over last year. The Department of Health and Human Services, $119 billion, an increase of $22 billion over uh, 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 2021. And Department of Labor, $14 billion, an increase of $1.7 billion over the 2021 um, a fiscal year. These programs directly impact the lives of Americans across the country, especially children, families, and seniors. As we draft a new bill for fiscal year 2022, it is important to hear from the public about their top priorities. In fact, I would say today's hearing is one of the most important things that we do. So I look very, very much uh, forward to today's uh, a, a testimony. Uh, now, I would like to recognize my good friend from Michigan, uh, Congressman John Molinar, for any remarks he cares to make. Congressman Molinar. Thank you very much, uh, and good morning, Chairwoman DeLauro. And uh, I just want to say I appreciate your many long hours of hard work as our chair of our full Appropriations Committee, as well as your work as leader of our subcommittee. And uh, as you know, our friend, uh, Ranking Member Tom Cole could not be here this morning for the opening of this hearing, but this is the first public witness hearing we've had as a, a subcommittee in two years. And uh, unfortunately, due to the beginning of the pandemic year last year, we we're unable to hear from public witnesses. And I'm really glad to see this hearing returning again. Public Witness Day provides an opportunity for members of the public to come before this panel and draw our attention to particular issues of importance to them. Unlike most hearings, anyone can appear before us and we receive a wide variety of submissions each year. On a personal note, one of the best speeches I've ever seen before this panel came from a member of the public when we heard from Frank Stevens, a man with Down syndrome who spoke during a special hearing in 2017. Public witnesses see federal programs in a different light and they tell us about their challenges while letting us know what this subcommittee can do to help. There's already a lot of common ground we all share as Americans, including our support for research at NIH and the hope that we will be able to find cures for cancer, Alzheimer's, and other illnesses that affect so many Americans. I also want to give out a special shout out this morning to a family friend, Dr. Carl Reddy, uh, who uh, works with the disease detectives at the CDC and around the world and appreciate their hard work. Uh, this Public Witness Day will be informative as our nation looks to fully put the COVID-19 pandemic behind us. More than 270 million vaccine doses have been administered, and the number of new cases is dropping across the country. 
This is incredible progress, and I hope today's witnesses are looking forward to a more optimistic future. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming, and we look forward to your testimony. And with that, Madam Chair, I'll yield back. And again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Molinar. Thank you for pointing out that because of COVID, we were unable to do this, but we have continued to do this uh, you know, prior to that. And it is really so informative. And I think it makes a difference in what direction that we try to take when we are crafting the recommendations. <coughs> Um, and with that, please let me recognize, oh, let me, I, I, I have to do these two instructions. So let me be clear about this. Let me remind today's witnesses, you will have five minutes for your oral testimony. Your full written testimony will be entered into the hearing record. When you see the yellow light, this is an indication that you have one minute remaining for your oral testimony. We ask that you limit the testimony uh, uh, to your uh, to the five minute period out of respect for fellow witnesses um, and without proceeding further with this let me recognize our first witness and that is um, Mr. John Auerbach with Trust for America. Mr. Auerbach. Well thank you very much. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here today. I'm here on behalf of Trust for America's Health and I'm pleased to submit this testimony. Communities across the country are overwhelmed with responding to COVID-19 with a depleted public health infrastructure and workforce, while also responding to long-standing issues due to increases in chronic disease, substance misuse, and environmental threats. Trust for America's Health, or TIFA's recent report, The Impact of Chronic Underfunding on America's Public Health System, finds that although health threats continue to increase, core public health budgets at the federal and state levels remain stagnant. While Congress has allocated billions of dollars to address COVID, this funding is uh, short-term and largely for use during the pandemic, understandably. It follows a similar pattern since 9-11 of underfunding core public health, but then providing significant infusions of emergency funding when a disaster hits. However, without an investment in public health year in and year out, problems can't be prevented or emergencies reduced. And therefore, TIFA urges Congress to fund the CDC at $10 billion for the fiscal year 2022 budget. In my written statement, I discuss several TIFA priorities, but for this testimony, I'll focus on just a few. In terms of emergency preparedness, the response was weakened because CDC's emergency preparedness funding had been repeatedly cut, reducing essential training and eliminating expert personnel. CDC's public health emergency preparedness program has been reduced 48% since fiscal year 2003 um, when inflation is considered. We recommend funding it at $824 million. The pandemic has also demonstrated the impact of failing to invest in comprehensive readiness and surge capacity in the healthcare delivery system. Funding for the hospital preparedness program has been uh, reduced by 62% since that fiscal year 2003 when inflation is considered. We recommend at least 474 million for this program. COVID-19 was exacerbated by preventable chronic health conditions, including obesity. In 2018, 42% of adults had obesity, and even though obesity accounts for nearly 21% of U.S. healthcare spending, funding for CDC's Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity has only enough money to implement its core state program in 16 states. TIFA recommends at least $125 million to support this work in additional states. The pandemic also reinforced the differential impact of social and economic conditions on the health of communities of color. Two programs at CDC are effective in addressing racial and ethnic disparities. The Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health or REACH program, Kiefer recommends funding that at 102 million to continue scaling to all 50 states. And another program, the Good Health and Wellness in Indian Country program, which promotes activities among uh, American Indian Native Americans, we recommend $27 million for that important program. The outbreak has also demonstrated how important it is to protect the health of older adults. Right now, CDC doesn't have a comprehensive health promotion program for older adults. We recommend the committee provide CDC with 
50 million dollars to create such a program. Social determinants of health are also key. Housing, employment, food security, public health departments are uniquely situated to support community-based efforts and multi-sector collaborations to promote healthier social and economic conditions. TIFA thanks the committee for $3 million in its uh, fiscal year 2021 budget to establish a new CDC program that addresses social determinants. Aligned with the president's request though, TIFA recommends at least 153 million to further develop CDC's social determinants of health activities, a level that's been endorsed by more than 200 organizations. In conclusion, let me say that the COVID-19 pandemic has reiterated the dangers of ignoring and underfunding the core public health system at the local, state, tribal, and territorial levels, as well as at CDC. Let's not wait for the next emergency to fix this problem. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very, very much for a very thorough presentation. I might add Congressman Pocan has joined us as well, I, I understand. So, but thank you for a very thorough rundown. I think ov overall, I think you un understand that the, 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 the subcommittee has indeed recognized what you have I've been speaking about in terms of public health infrastructure. Uh, and we're committed to doing that. We have been doing it over the last couple of years. We will continue. I can't talk about levels at the moment. We're waiting for the, the we, we, we are uh, with, with the, the, the Biden uh, budget blueprint at the moment, we're talking about $1.6 billion uh, for, for CDC, uh, but we don't know what the, you know, what the budget on May 27th will yield. Uh, so, but the issues that you mentioned are uppermost on our minds here, the social determinants of health, the issue of the, the chronic uh, illnesses and on the issue of, 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 of obesity. So um, uh, thank you and thank you for the great work that you do um, in, these, uh, in these areas. And I will continue to ask you to uh, keep the pressure on and keep us focused on the issues uh, that will make a difference. Uh, uh, for you know, for the American people in this in, in this area, we 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 need your counsel, guidance, um, and your external pressure on the institution. So, uh, with that, let me ask if my uh, colleague Co Congressman Molinar, if you have any questions, um, uh, or, or any of my other colleagues have questions. Hearing none, many 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 thanks. Uh, very much for being here. And again, thank you for the work that you do with the Trust for American House. We trust in the trust. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks. Uh, and with that, I'd like to recognize uh, Mark Herzog, um, who is with the American Association of Dental Research. Chair DeLauro, Member Moltmar, and members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the American Association for Dental Research, or AADR, I am pleased to provide testimony today in support of increased funding in fiscal year 2022 for the National Institute of Dental and Cranial Facial Research and the National Institutes of Health. <clears throat> My name is Mark Hertzberg, and I am professor in the Department of Diagnostic and Biological Sciences at the University of Minnesota School of Dentistry. I also serve as president of AADR and chair of the board of directors. AADR, the largest division of the International Association for Dental Research, represents more than 3,100 members in the United States. Its mission is to drive dental, oral, and craniofacial research to advance the health and well being of Americans. To advance overall health, AADR and our oral health community colleagues seek at least $520 million for NIDCR and $46 billion for NIH in fiscal year 2022. AADR is grateful to Congress for its continued support of NIH. We hope that you will support the requested funding for critical research even more urgent amidst the global COVID-19 pandemic. Research in this country has been negatively impacted by this pandemic. At the University of Minnesota, we felt the strain of the pandemic firsthand. Our lab has slowly reopened using an approved social distancing protocol. 
Only one person could work in the lab at a time. Productivity was reduced to one-sixth of pre-pandemic levels and has yet to return to normal, even though every scientist is fully vaccinated. Perhaps more crucially, our, our dental clinics were forced to close except for emergencies. This made providing care for our patients, most of whom receive public assistance and have serious dental needs, impossible. To safely reopen, my clinical colleagues followed CDC guidance, but needed more information to be confident. In response, the Dean of Clinics, a virologist, and a mechanical engineer who is expert in aerosol research formed a new collaboration. As a result, new barrier protocols were implemented and the clinics reopened without any COVID transmission. Like most research institutions, NIDCR pivoted skillfully to support coronavirus research, even though it did not receive targeted federal coronavirus relief funding. To date, NIDCR has funded approximately $3.9 million of immediate and high impact research to protect and ensure the safety of personnel and patients in dental practices during the COVID-19 pandemic. Complementing the University of Minnesota research, these studies sought comprehensive answers to critical public health research questions about dental care, the use of personal protective equipment, and aerosol and droplet transmission in dental settings. Notably, recent NIDCR-supported research shows that coronavirus can infect oral cells and salivary glands which may explain some signs of COVID-19, including loss of taste. Also, salivary glands appear to be coronavirus factories. Transmission through coronavirus-laden salivary aerosols must be considered as a threat for super spreader events. Clearly, dental, oral, and cranial facial research is critical to our health and the prevention and treatment of diseases. Recently, the AADR published a COVID-19 research agenda highlighting the great need for new knowledge to combat the pandemic. The NIDCR will continue to be the driver of this research moving forward. We urge the committee to ensure that NIDCR approaches its full potential by providing at least $520 million in funding next year. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. AADR looks forward to continuing our work with Congress and the NIH to build a robust research enterprise that benefits the health of all Americans. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Herzberg. I appreciate it. And once again, uh, just laying out what is necessary. Uh, we are um, uh, I'm waiting to ask the questions. The NIH is coming up. Uh, for uh, a hearing uh, next week, and we'll we'll talk about the specific area. Uh, we are waiting on the budget to find out what we will be uh, dealing with. As you know, there's about two billion dollars for the NIH, and then uh, six billion for an, uh, uh, something called ARPA H. Uh, um, and but my question will be, uh, how are we dealing with the regular uh, institutes and the kind of funding that they will that they will they will need? It's always been a mystery to me that um, uh, we uh, divorce uh, our head from the rest of our body when we're thinking about whether it's dental uh, or vision uh, or hearing. Uh, so uh, I thank you. And I, I know that this is an issue that um, uh, makes a real difference in, in, in particularly in underrepresented communities and in low income areas uh, and uh, is a cause of great uh, uh, health uh, dif difficulties in the future. So I thank you for your testimony and uh, uh, I, I'm sure we'll be addressing the issue. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Let me introduce uh, Angela Kimball with the National Alliance for Illness. Chairwoman Lauro, 
uh, and members of the subcommittee. On behalf of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, I want to express our gratitude for this subcommittee's strong bipartisan support of mental health and the investments you've made, including for research at the National Institutes of Health and the National Institute of Mental Health. And I'd like to specifically express NAMI's appreciation for this subcommittee's hearing last week on building a mental health crisis response system, NAMI's top priority and the focus of my testimony. Today, the default response to many people in crisis is a law enforcement response, which often ends in trauma or tragedy. But as you stated at the hearing, Madam Chairwoman, there is something we can do about it. Thank you for your leadership. Last year, Congress took an important step in transforming crisis care by passing the Bipartisan National Suicide Hotline Designation Act, which created 988 as a three-digit crisis line. 988 provides a unique opportunity to develop crisis response systems with three core elements. First, crisis call centers to answer 988 calls. Second, mobile crisis teams that can provide an in-person response. And third, crisis receiving and stabilization programs for those in crisis who need more follow-up. While there's a clear vision for successful 988 crisis response, few systems meet these standards. As a result, whether through the annual appropriations process, broader efforts to upgrade our country's infrastructure or other means, Congress must make significant investments over the next 10 years in 988 crisis infrastructure. For fiscal year 2022, NAMI urges this subcommittee to include 240 million to substantially expand capacity for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which will answer 988 calls. And we're gratified that this subcommittee included 35 million in the mental health block grant to fund a 5% set aside for crisis services last year. To build on this valuable start, we're requesting an increase to 10% for fiscal year 2022 to develop services such as mobile crisis teams. NAMI is also requesting 12.5 million for the SAMHSA Strengthening Community Crisis Response Systems Program to help communities develop intensive services like crisis stabilization. Without the appropriate infrastructure in place, a person in crisis often gets a police response, not a mental health response. And that's exactly what happened to Walter Wallace Jr. Walter had a mental health crisis in October 2020 and his family called 911. And instead of getting the help that he needed, he was shot and killed. And he's not alone. One in four fatal police shootings are of people with mental illness, with one in three being people of color. So what does an appropriate crisis response look like? I can tell you because I not only represent NAMI, I'm also the parent of a child who's been in crisis. A few years ago, my son experienced a psychotic episode where he was delusional and threatening, believing I had conspired with the FBI to bug his home. I was able to text a code word to a friend who called the mental health crisis line. When there was a knock on the door, my son told me not to answer it. And when I could see his mind slip to another place for just an instant, I ran for the door. A mobile crisis team had arrived. The team was kind and non-threatening. They talked with me and my son, saw the conditions in the house, and after putting the pieces together, the team lead said, I'm hearing, Alex, that you haven't slept for days and things are getting kind of intense. Do I have that right? He said, yeah, my head hurts and I just want to sleep, but I can't. And she said, I know a doctor at the hospital who'll definitely be able to help you get to sleep and to stop your head from hurting if you're willing to go with me. Does that sound okay? And remarkably, he said, yeah, I'll go. The next step in his journey was the crisis stabilization unit, which after 23 hours moved him to a psychiatric inpatient unit because he was still delusional. While I can't say the rest of his journey went well, the crisis response did. We were lucky, but it shouldn't take luck. Appropriate crisis response should be available to everyone, no matter where they live. And with 988, we have an historic opportunity to change how our country responds to people in crisis. I hope the subcommittee will champion this critical change and NAMI stands ready to serve as a resource to you. Thank you for your leadership. 
I want to say a thank you to you, uh, Angela, and thanks to NAMI for all the great work that you do. This is a very, very appropriate topic. We had a hearing devoted to this uh, issue on, uh, it was about uh, mental, um, mental health, uh, and it was about law enforcement, and uh, specifically about the 988 uh, number, um, and it goes going into effect next, next July, but it was also brought to our attention uh, that we can introduce this um, uh, 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 you, you know, a crisis line, if you will. Uh, but if we don't provide the infrastructure uh, to make it workable, that we will not succeed at doing it. So uh, we have heard uh, from you and thank you. Thank you. I should have started by saying this. Thank you for your courage and telling your own personal story. And and it's our hope that your boy is, um, is doing well. Uh, but it's not easy to tell your own story, uh, but it has a powerful effect. Uh, on, on all of us. So we are very attuned and aware of this issue about the 988 a crisis line um, and want to be able to provide the resources that are necessary to make it successful so that people get that mobile team and the, the kind of crisis intervention that they need um, and not be incarcerated uh, or not, you know, have to undergo um, a, a law enforcement protocol uh, rather than a, 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 a a medical protocol. So thank you very, very much for your testimony this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you. And now please let me uh, introduce to you e, uh, Dr. E. Dale Abel with the Friends of the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. Madam Chair DeLauro and members of the subcommittee. My name is Dale Abel. I'm the immediate past president of the Endocrine Society and chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Iowa. As an endocrinologist and biomedical researcher, I am proud to represent the 35 patient, physician, and research organizations that are members of the Friends of the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, NIDDK. We urge you to support the NIH with a $3.1 billion increase for FY22 including a proportionate increase of 157 million for NIDDK. We also ask you to provide emergency supplemental funds for NIH, including dedicated support for the NIDDK to enable COVID-related research and support research recovery from the pandemic. NIDDK supports and conducts research to combat a portfolio of diseases that are some of the most chronic, common, consequential and costly affecting people in this country. Many of these diseases are also associated with health disparities exacerbated by COVID-19. Your previous support for NIH has led to tremendous and some might find unbelievable advances, advancements by NIDDK to improve people's health, including uh, research on an immune targeting drug that delayed type one diabetes progression in high risk individuals for at least three years research defining subgroups of people with chronic kidney disease in paving the way for kidney precision medicine. Adults and pediatric studies are testing potential therapies and uncovering genetic, racial, and ethnic risk factors for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. NIDDK supported scientists are studying intestinal stem cells to identify and develop novel therapies to regenerate or regrow the human gut. While grateful for the funding that you have provided to the NIH and the NIDDK, our organizations note that NIDDK's FY21 appropriation was proportionally less than other institutes and that NIDDK had not received any emergency funding despite researching diseases as are associated with increased risk of severe COVID-19 outcomes, such as diabetes and obesity, and are themselves public health crises. Our understanding of COVID-19 continues to evolve. What we originally understood to be an infectious respiratory virus, we now know disproportionately impacts individuals with diabetes, obesity, liver disease, and kidney diseases. COVID-19 infection damages a variety of organ systems, including the kidneys, and it may even contribute to new onset kidney failure and diabetes. Patients are experiencing hematologic complications like blood clots. Yet without additional support, and that UDK must divert crucial funds from its existing portfolio to better understand these characteristics of COVID-19. With emergency supplemental funding, NIDDK will be able to support research on SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 
as it intersects with and affects people with diseases within its portfolio without slowing advances for patients who benefit from its core research. Further, while new infections with SARS-CoV-2 have decreased in the US, our understanding of the long-term consequences of COVID-19, so-called long COVID, is far from over and creates another necessary area of research. In addition to addressing new areas of research, supplemental funds are needed to restart research projects, programs, and clinical trials that were underway before the pandemic and were stopped or delayed, support early stage investigators as they face new challenges in making progress in their careers, especially women investigators and others who are disproportionately affected by caregiving roles and members of groups underrepresented in research, and also to address increased research costs. All of this leads to simply put, yet challenging goal. While addressing COVID-19, we also need to continue to combat the diseases within NIDDK's mission, which will continue to place an enormous personal and financial toll on this country long after the pandemic is over. Bolstering funding for NIDDK will help ensure that critical research continues. Progress against COVID-19 is made, and NIDDK's commitment to understanding the roles of social determinants of health and health disparities is realized. Thank you very much for your support of the missions of the NIH and the NIDDK, and I'm pleased to answer any questions that you might have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for your testimony. Uh, and uh, I can uh, assure you, and I thank you for pointing out um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, what the NIDDK did, did receive. I'm always conscious of wanting to make sure uh, that, the, uh, that the institutes um, uh, are, are, are seeing a, a significant increase uh, in their funding. We tried to do that uh, a year ago. Uh, we will be having uh, the NIH um, uh, coming forward uh, next week um, and uh, with representatives uh, from, uh, from a number of the institutes, and I believe including the NIDDK. Uh, so we'll be able to uh, hear from them, listen to them, and uh, to try to be responsive as, as, as possible we can be. I want to be honest with you. We do not have the full budget yet from the, uh, uh, from, from the president. We know that they've divided the funding between $2 billion for NI, a regular NIH um, uh, efforts and a new ARPA-H, uh, which is a, a way to try to, to, to deal with um, uh, a kind of a laser focus on, on, specific, uh, on specific areas of research for discovery. So, but we were looking to make sure that, that we have a balance of those funds so that we can look at uh, what the other institutes and, and, and NIDDK, um, uh, what are the resources that you need in order to try to move forward because the issues that you bring up are serious. Um, and uh, I had uh, someone yesterday speaking to me about, about uh, you know, the amount of research, et cetera, for kidney disease um, in relationship to other areas. So thank you so much for your testimony uh, and, your, and, and for your commitment. Much appreciated. Thank, thank you, you very much for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to now introduce uh, Dr. David Tuvison, American Association of Cancer, Cancer Research. Dr. Tuvison, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair. Deloro, Ranking Member Cole, um, and Representatives Molinar, Klein, and other members of your subcommittee. I'm David Tuvison, the Director of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Cancer Center and the Chief Scientist for the Lust Garden Foundation for Pancreatic Cancer Research. Today, I'm here as President of the American Association for Cancer Research, the oldest and first organization uh, studied cancer with over 115 years uh, behind it. On behalf of all of our 48,000 members, which are predominantly in the U.S., but worldwide, I ask for your support of at least $46.1 billion in FY 2022, funding for the entirety of the NIH, and $7.6 billion for the National Cancer Institute. We are in an era of unprecedented progress against cancer, number two killer of Americans, including advances in immunotherapies and targeted anti-cancer therapies that have led to spectacular decreases in cancer mortality. As an aside, when I was training as a young oncologist, 
Melanoma patients really had no hope once the disease had spread. Today, that's not the case. Many of them, like former President Jimmy Carter, lived many years due to the advent of therapies. And this was chiefly due to investments at the National Cancer Institute. We have these new tools and therapies that we could only dream of 30 years ago when I was trained. But we need to do more um, because we have many cancer patients who we are not serving currently. So both in the, in the process of finding new diagnoses for many types of cancer and new therapies to improve the health outcomes and reduce health disparities that you've heard about from our other um, speakers today. Additionally, the funding that the National Cancer Institute provides to the NCI designated cancer centers, the 73 located throughout our country, that are located in largely populated areas, is supporting the pioneering research at these academic centers, serving patients in their communities, and training the next generation of cancer scientists. There are so many breakthroughs within our grasp, but to achieve them, we need federal investments to keep up with demand on basic research for cancer. And that's what brings me to you today. Since fiscal year 2015, thanks to your leadership, Chairwoman Deloro, and your subcommittee, NIH funding has increased nearly 42%. But due to other funding needs at the NIH, including worthy initiatives that take away from the top line and a nearly 50% increase in the actual applications received at the NCI since 2013, the funding increases haven't kept up with demand. Even with the funding you've provided, the percentage of NCI grant applications that are funded, referred to as the success rate, is the lowest amongst all institutes at the NIH. In FY 2020, the NIH-wide success rate for competing research grants, or RPGs, was nearly 21%. However, in the National Cancer Institute, it was only 12.8%. That's the highest it's been in the past six years. 12.8% means 12 out of 100 people get their grant funded. NCI has been stretching dollars to fund more grants. The NCI director, Dr. Norman Sharpless, released his 15 by 25 milestone, an effort to increase the number of R01 grants funded until it reaches the 15th percentile in 2025. AACR strongly supports this important mission. Achieve the goal of funding more meritorious research, more funding will be needed. While the success rates at the other institutes is much higher, the, this low rate that we have at the NCI is really not sustainable to meet our pledge to apply new cancer science and medicine towards improving patient outcomes. With the low success rate, I also worry a lot that the optimism and a creativity of our young workforce will be lost and they will choose other career paths. The United States cannot lead the world in cancer discoveries, but the NCI success rate is so low that researchers leave our field. Thanks to your leadership, language was included in the last two explanatory statements to prioritize competing grants and sustain commitments to continuing grants. I humbly ask you to continue these efforts in FY 2022 and provide funding to meet Dr. Sharpless's goal so the cancer research community can accelerate the path to discoveries and save lives. Lastly, I know cancer is personal for you, as it is for me. Thank you for this opportunity and for your commitment to bringing us closer to our mutual goal of can conquering cancer. Thank you, Chairwoman Laura. Thank you so much and uh, for, for, for your testimony and advocacy. Um, uh, you, you, are, you are right. This is a very personal uh, issue for me, uh, as it is for you. And as, a, as a sur survivors, we know the value of the uh, of biomedical research uh, and uh, its ability to give you a second chance at life. So you can um, well understand, and I thank you for laying out the percentages and we'll be very, very mindful of the NCI uh, as we move forward. Um, uh, I'm waiting to see what maybe final numbers may be with the, uh, the NIH uh, with the May 27th budget at the, um, at the moment there is the, um, uh, uh, which is an area of concern that I have, uh, you know, with the $6 billion and $2 billion, et cetera, it's all under the NIH, uh, but, but, uh, but uh, separate directions. And I wanna be able to make sure that we are uh, uh, providing 
uh, of the uh, the uh, the NCI with the resources that it needs in, in, in order to to look to those discoveries to cure. And I also concern myself with the loss of the um, of these young and eager uh, scientists and uh, lose them to uh, to somewhere else. So please be assured that this is an area that I will uh, that I will uh, uh, pay attention to as we uh, as we move forward. But thank you very, very much. Uh, and, ma and many thanks for the work of the uh, of the association for a cancer um, research. Uh, you really are, are extraordinary. So thank you so very much, Dr. Tubas. I really appreciate your testimony this morning. Thank you. Um, let me now recognize uh, Aaron Prangley on the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify concerning the fiscal year 2022 appropriations for programs authorized by the Developmental Disabilities Assistance and Bill of Rights Act, the DD Act, Assistive Technology Act, Autism Cares Act, the Lifespan Respite Care Act, and the National Family Caregiver Support Program and Parent Information Centers. My name is Erin Prangley and I am the Director of Policy for the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities. I co-chair the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities, Developmental Disabilities, Autism and Family Supports Task Force, along with staff from Autism Speaks, the Autism Society of America, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, and the Leadership Education in Neurodevelopmental and Related Disabilities, or the LEND programs. My testimony today focuses on task force priorities for federal programs that directly relate to individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, IDD, including autism spectrum disorders, family supports, and the prevention of child abuse and neglect. Decades after the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the whispered concerns among people with IDD about the dangers of living isolated and stripped of supports and services were realized when the pandemic hit. Predictably, we saw the virus spread quickly in unsafe congregate settings, but people with IDD living in the community also suffered great loss. One study showed that having an intellectual disability was the strongest independent risk factor for presenting with COVID-19 diagnosis and the strongest independent risk factor other than age for COVID-19 mortality. The CDC stated risk factors for people with disabilities contracting COVID included people who cannot avoid coming into close contact with others, such as their direct support professionals and family members, people who have trouble understanding information or practicing preventative measures, and people who may not be able to communicate symptoms of illness. Moving forward, I urge you to learn from this tragedy about how the circumstances of simply living with IDD mean that people face these obstacles, not only during pandemics, but every day of their lives. It's true that relying on direct support workers and families, having difficulty understanding language and difficulty communicating uh, were obstacles to surviving COVID-19. It's equally true that these same obstacles present when people with IDD are seeking employment, access to transportation, living independently, and participating in activities that people without disabilities simply take for granted. Your support fully funding these programs is necessary for people with IDD to have access to community. For over 50 years, Congress has supported programs authorized by the DD Act that are designed to improve the lives of people with IDD in every state and territory through capacity building, systems change, advocacy, and enforcement and protection of civil rights. We request funding 85 million for the state and territorial councils on developmental disabilities, 45 million for protection and advocacy, 45 million for the university centers on excellence in developmental disabilities, and 14 million for projects of national significance. We also request 150 million increase for the Autism Cares Act programs at federal agencies engaged in autism research and services. The Autism Cares Program expand research, 
create public awareness and surveillance, and expand the interdisciplinary health professional training needed to identify and support people with autism spectrum disorders and their families. We also request 50 million to fund the Assistive Technology Act programs to help people with disabilities access and acquire the assisted technology devices that they need to live, work, and attend school in their communities. We request 14.2 million for the Lifespan Respite Care Program and 205.5 million for the National Family Caregiver Support Program. These programs help states build that respite capacity and help family caregivers afford respite services. And then finally, 30 million for the parent training and information centers. These programs provide assistance to families of children with disabilities aged birth to 26 and help parents and youth navigate early intervention and special education. Thank you for your consideration of this request and your continued attention to these important national priorities. Thank you. Thank you very, very much uh, for your uh, uh, testimony uh, and uh, so eloquently laying out, uh, you know, the, the, the risk factors were, you know, were overwhelming before the pandemic and more than overwhelming. <laughs> During the pandemic, and um, uh, I, I, I think you, you know, you put your finger on it with the, the, the issue of isolation and uh, it can, connected with, uh, 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 you know, a, a disability or with, you know, with IDD. I particularly thought about that in terms of, I think about it in terms of everyone, but particularly of, of children with developmental um, disabilities and. Uh, who saw their really their whole social order just disrupted, um, and uh, that again the isolation, but any kind of routine or uh, 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 that they may be accustomed to uh, not, not being able to be uh, with other with other children, not being able to be with the uh, the the, uh, the the specialized teaching that they may have needed during this process uh, and 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 probably uh, that parents unaccustomed to dealing with this 24 hours a day um, uh, you know the stress uh, that was uh, and that that kind of stress is also transmitted uh, to, uh, to a child or you know to, to a, an, an adult and trying to uh, be able to cope with the with the difficulty so um, uh, uh, you, you know again uh, an, an area uh, that I take very, very serious uh, and uh, one that we will take, uh, you know, a hard look at. Obviously, as I've said to others, so much depends on what the final budget numbers uh, are, are, are going to uh, are going to uh, are going to be. Uh, but it is uh, not in an area uh, that uh, any of us on the subcommittee. I think you've got bipartisan support for looking at. Um, how, in fact, uh, that we deal with autism, family support programs, uh, and the fundamental disability that a person might have, and how we can uh, uh, be uh, uh, helpful in terms of providing the resources uh, that you uh, uh, that you need to, to move forward. Um, uh, and I particularly think about the areas of, of um, uh, abuse and neglect, and that we cannot. Uh, that, that's something we cannot tolerate um, in, in this space. It's difficult enough. Um, and so, uh, th therefore, we need to safeguard against those efforts. So, again, thank you so much uh, for the work that you are doing. Um, and uh, uh, thank you for your testimony this morning. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thanks. Uh, let me now um, uh, in introduce Dr. Carl Reddy, uh, who is the Director of Training Programs in Epidemiology and Public Health Interventions Network, the Task Force uh, for Global Health. Uh, Dr. Reddy. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman DeLaro. My name is Dr. Carl Reddy from the Task Force for Global Health. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. The Task Force, based in Atlanta, is a nonprofit founded in 1984. 
Our 16 programs work with partners in more than 150 countries to eliminate diseases, ensure access to vaccines and essential medicines, and strengthen health systems to protect populations. My program, TEFINET, is a global network of field epidemiology training programs. We are funded primarily through the US CDC. You might be wondering what a field epidemiologist does and why it is important for all countries to have them. Think of it this way. When there's a fire, we call upon trained firefighters to rush to the scene and put it out as soon as possible. Field epidemiologists are the firefighters of public health. When there is a disease outbreak, a natural disaster, or a humanitarian crisis, they are deployed to the scene. They are also responsible for setting up the fire alarms in the first place by establishing disease surveillance systems to catch cases early. Their task is to understand how and why the health threat is occurring, who is affected, and how to stop its spread. For this reason, they are known as disease detectives. They work at ministries of health or national public health institutes like our CDC. Without them, countries simply cannot identify or control disease threats. Our 75 programs have trained more than 19,000 field epidemiologists in more than 100 countries. They have investigated more than 12,000 outbreaks and developed more than 5,000 disease surveillance systems. FETPs work on all disease threats, from measles to Ebola to malaria. More recently, they have been the linchpin in efforts to stop the COVID-19 pandemic. They have been working around the clock to trace contacts, investigate and manage cases, analyze data, and educate their communities. Without them, many governments would not have access to reliable data. In the poorest countries, there is no other workforce to conduct contract tracing or case investigations. Before coming to the task force, I was the director of the South African FETP, started with CDC funding in 2006. Like other FETPs over time, as we developed our national capacity, ownership for the program was transferred to the National Institute of Communicable Diseases, South Africa's CDC. Because we had developed strong internal expertise, we were able to investigate and resolve disease threats that might formerly have required outside experts. For example, following an outbreak of diarrheal disease, FETP trainees identified the root cause, poor maintenance at the water treatment plant. As a result of the FETP investigation, the town installed a new water plant, saving lives and helping the economy with healthier, more productive citizens. To offer another example, Guinea in West Africa established an FETP program following the 2014 to 2016 Ebola outbreak, which claimed thousands of lives and resulted in cases being treated here in the United States. Guinea is now facing a new Ebola outbreak. This time, FETPs led the development and implementation of the country's Ebola response plan. Guinea has had a dramatically improved response. The vast majority of suspected cases are being investigated and the spread of Ebola is being controlled. The global community recognizes the important leadership of the United States to FETPs through the CDC. As a result of congressional support for CDC's mission, other partners have joined forces in an ambitious plan to develop and strengthen programs worldwide. Recently, TEFINET and the Task Force for Global Health worked with partners to develop the Global Field Epidemiology Roadmap. TEFINET is coordinating a strategic leadership group to lead the implementation of this roadmap so that all countries can develop and sustain the field epidemiology capacity needed to avert public health crises and their devastating human and economic costs. With the support of this committee, more than 100 countries now have a field epidemiology workforce with measurable results. Our roadmap shows how we can build upon that success to develop, to develop FETPs in many more. We look forward to continuing to work with you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much. I'm wondering if um, I have a dear friend, uh, a South African friend, uh, Dr. Wilmot James, um, uh, who was at Columbia, who was uh, uh, actually the former shadow minister of health uh, in South Africa. Uh, so he has uh, been a very helpful and instrumental to me to understand uh, the issues of global health security and also uh, the advancements made in, in South Africa uh, with regard to a South Africa CDC, if you, if you will. Um, the issue of global health um, is, 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 is one that is of clearly importance uh, to me because these illnesses or these diseases uh, know no boundaries. Um, and uh, in our current case, unless we are um, uh, making sure uh, that the uh, uh, other countries uh, and maybe less industrialized countries are having uh, access to vaccines and vaccinations, um, then no, no one is really secure. Um, and uh, that has uh, 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 really um, argued that, that case. Uh, and also along with several colleagues was uh, instrumental uh, in uh, working with this, the current administration um, in, uh, 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 in their position with the WTO with regard to India and South Africa um, on the licensing of patents uh, on a temporary basis so that um, both India and South Africa develop vaccines and, and move more quickly to, uh, to safeguard um, uh, 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 you know, just safeguard, save lives. It's not about safeguarding, it's about saving people's lives. Uh, and we, we can't as a nation be satisfied with uh, other countries being 20 or 30 percent vaccinated. Uh, we must do all that we can. And that includes, uh, in this instance, you know, making sure the vaccine is available to other countries. But in the broader context, which you make reference to, uh, I think it's a critically important. Um, more than that, it's a responsibility, a moral responsibility that we have uh, to be looking toward how we deal with global health uh, security. Uh, so you have my strong support uh, in this effort and uh, would welcome any and all of the information that you might uh, forward to us in this area in order to, um, uh, to buttress uh, our case here and your case here. Um, we cannot live with people who think, uh, let's just safeguard America first and forget about the rest of the world. Uh, we don't have that luxury. Uh, so I, I wanna say thank you to you for uh, all that you are doing and, and for TEFNET and, uh, um, uh, and these efforts, but I would welcome any further information that you all have uh, which can help us um, uh, guide us uh, in this direction. So thank you very, very much, Dr. Reddy. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman. I'll send that information through. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me now uh, uh, re recognize uh, Michael, uh, Michael Crair um, uh, uh, to uh, give testimony. But before I do that, uh, let me uh, uh, just more formally introduce uh, Michael, who serves at Yale University. Um, he serves at Yale in New Haven as Vice Provost for Research, uh, the William Ziegler III uh, Professor in the Devel Department of Neuroscience, Professor of Ophthalmology and Visual Science, and Deputy Dean for Scientific Affairs in the Basic Science Departments. Uh, Dr. Crayer maintains an active research program that develops and employs advanced imaging techniques to examine the basic mechanisms that mediate brain circuit development. And he has made fundamental contributions to our understanding of neural activity in the developing brain, um, uh, demonstrating that early spontaneous neural uh, uh, activity is an essential part of normal brain development. Uh, currently exploring the mechanisms by which this activity is generated. Um, and he's gonna discuss uh, the, the uh, administration's uh, funding for the NIH uh, uh, for federal uh, agency research uh, recovery uh, as presented in the RISE Act and funding for the National Eye Institute. I'll also give us an update on NEI breakthrough research to save sight and restore vision. We're glad to hear from you uh, this morning, Dr. Crayer. 
Thank you so much. That's just a wonderful introduction, Rose. I really appreciate it. Good morning. Um, as Rosa said, my name is Michael Kerr. I'm the William Ziegler III Professor in the Departments of Neuroscience and Ophthalmology and Visual Science, and also the Vice Provost for Research at Yale University. I receive grant support from the NIH for my research, including from the NEI, the NINDS, and the NIMH. I'm pleased to testify today on behalf of the National Alliance for Eye and Vision Research, or NAVER, a nonprofit advocacy coalition serving as the friends of the National Eye Institute. NAVER is grateful to Congress, especially this subcommittee and, the, and its center, uh, Senate counterpart for its strong bi bipartisan support of NIH funding in recent years. The 13 billion increase in funding from FY16 to 21 helped the NIH regain lost ground after a decade of effectively flat budgets. Investments in the NIH are essential for advancing our understanding of fundamental life and health sciences, contributing to innovation and improving quality of life. Stable long-term NIH support also helps prepare the nation to combat unprecedented health threats, as has been abundantly obvious during the COVID-19 pandemic. To maintain momentum in FY22, Neighbor strongly supports the $51 billion in NIH funding proposed by President Biden, which represents a 7.4% increase in its base budget. This increase will support promising science across all institutes and centers, ensure continued funding for special initiatives established through the 21st Century Cures Act, support early stage investigators, and allow the NIH's base budget to grow by 5% relative to biomedical inflation. Neighbor also urges one-time emergency funding for federal agency research recovery investments, including the bipartisan RISE Act to enable NIH funded investigators to mitigate pandemic related disruptions without foregoing promising new science. Although pandemic-related closures impacted all researchers, early-stage investigators have been most acutely impacted. Neighbors Educational Foundation documented this impact, describing the, the distressing effect of the pandemic on the training, research, collaborations, and career progression of scientists with young families and emerging careers. Within the overall recommended budget increase for NIH, Neighbor also urges Congress to fund the NEI at $900 million, a 7.7% increase over FY21 that reflects both biomedical inflation and growth. Despite funding increases for the NEI between FY16 and 21, the current NEI budget is just 19% greater than pre-sequester funding, representing an annual growth rate of only 2.1%. This is less than the rate of biomedical inflation, which has effectively eroded purchasing power. While NEI-funded investigators have made great strides, there's growing demand for further breakthroughs to address the increasing burden of vision impairment and eye disease due to an aging population, the disproportionate risk of eye disease in fast-growing minority populations, and the impact on vision from numerous chronic diseases, such as diabetes. The COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated this burden since the use of electronic communication devices and e-learning platforms increases rates of myopia, dry eye, eye strain, and other vision disorders. Maintaining the momentum of vision research is vital to our overall health and quality of life, and since the U.S. is the acknowledged world leader in vision research and training the next generation of vision scientists, the health of the global research community and our leadership in biomedical innovation is at stake. Previous federal investments have led to major advances in the prevention of vision loss and the restoration of vision, from basic discoveries in the genetic causes of eye disease to the development of transformational techniques to diagnose and treat blinding disorders. I'd like to provide a couple of examples of these advances. NEI-funded scientists helped to show that vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, is responsible for abnormal blood vessel growth that occurs in diabetic retinopathy and advanced stages of age-related macular degeneration, known as AMD. The dry form of AMD is the leading cause of vision loss among our elderly population. FDA-approved anti-VEGF drug therapies slow the development of blood vessels in the eye, delay vision loss, and improve the vision of some patients suffering from AMD. The NEI has also been at the forefront of gene therapy approaches to both common and rare vision disorders. NEI-funded research has identified dozens of rare eye disease genes, including the gene responsible for Leber's congenital amaurosis, a devastating form of congenital blindness. In late 2017, NEI-sponsored research on Leber's amaurosis enabled the commercialization of one of the first FDA-approved gene therapies. Remarkably, the same gene therapy technology is being used now in an FDA-authorized COVID-19 vaccine. These technologies form the basis of many new and emerging disease therapies with NEI-funded research at the Vanguard. NEI's FY21 enacted budget of $836 million is less than half a percent of the $177 billion annual cost of vision impairment and eye disease, which is projected to grow to over $700 billion by 2050. In summary, 
investing $51 billion in FY22 NIH funding with $900 million for NEI funded vision research is an investment in our nation's overall health, which will result in treatments and therapies that can delay, reduce, and prevent future costs. It also increases productivity, helps individuals maintain independence, and improves quality of life. Thank you so much for offering me the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very, very much, and, and thank you for a, 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 such a you know, compelling testimony. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested in macular degeneration and with a, a family that is suffering uh, through that, uh, you know, at the, at, at, at the, at the moment. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, all, it's, it's, it's really fundamental for me. Uh, we, we will have, as I said, um, I, I try to have two hearings with regard to the uh, NIH. You know, we have the institutes will come up, which will be, you know, NCI, infectious diseases, uh, you know, et cetera. But I also want to bring up the others, including the Eye Institute, because I want to hear about uh, the direction that we're going in and what we need. And I too, I mean, I understand the two and a half percent. I, I tried, uh, I guess it was trying to, you know, it was last year, the year before us to bring up the increase to 5% uh, so forth, but I will be, be looking uh, at the uh, uh, NIH budget in a, in a way that um, uh, uh, really doesn't shortchange a number of the uh, of the smaller institutes, if you will, because the discoveries are as large as you, you know and 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 anywhere else. So, a particularly thank you for your for your work and your effort, and it's wonderful too uh, that uh, you are uh, uh, in uh, in New Haven and at Yale and. Uh, uh, where there is an amazing amount of research that is being done uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Couldn't be more proud to represent you in that context. So thank you so much for your testimony this morning, Dr. Crea. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, Rosa. Really appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Uh, if I now may ask uh, for the testimony of Lorraine Martin with the National Safety Council. Chair Delario, Ranking Member Claire Cole, and members of the committee, thank you so much for inviting me to testify on behalf of America's leading nonprofit safety advocate, the National Safety Council. On a typical day, 13 U.S. workers die from an unintentional injury suffered at work. And every day, over 12,600 more people sustain injuries at work that are serious enough to require medical consultation. As we look to the end of the pandemic, we must keep workers' health and make, make sure that they keep healthy and safe if we're gonna achieve the robust, lasting economic recovery that we're all looking for. Our full funding requests are included in my written testimony. Today, I would like to speak about several agencies that are critical to eliminating preventable death and injury from our workplaces to any place. These agencies are OSHA, NIOSH, and the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. Let me begin with OSHA. At no point in recent history has it been more important for the nation to have data-driven occupational safety and health information. OSHA's role in investigating preventable tragedies and assisting businesses through its partnership office is essential to promote safety throughout all workplaces for all workers. Key data, like the OSHA's top 10, details the top violations and helps employers understand where they need to be vigilant. The second agency I'd like to support here today is NIOSH, which has provided essential science-based information to workplaces throughout the entire pandemic. NIOSH has translated guidance on masking, physical distancing, sanitation, and other areas into practical instructions that workplaces have been able to understand and implement immediately to save lives. NIOSH also has focused on the role employers play in supporting workers' mental health and preventing substance use disorders, both issues which have been exacerbated by the pandemic. For example, the events of 2020 have led to the increase in anxiety, depression, and drug and alcohol use. 40% of U.S. adults reported that they struggled with mental health or substance use in June of 2020 and 70% of people with substance use disorders are employed. 
Additional funding for NIOSH and the Total Work Health Program would provide employers with vital training and technical assistance to support their workers. Before closing, I want to add my support for funding another part of CDC, the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control, or the Injury Center. The Injury Center provides public health strategies to combat issues like motor vehicle crashes, substance use disorder, and older adult falls, among other injuries. NSC and the National Council on Aging, along with 40 other partners, recently sent a letter to this committee asking for a modest increase in funding for the Injury Center to combat falls among older adults, an action I hope you'll consider. Thank you again for allowing me to testify here today. I know the committee has difficult decisions ahead about how to allocate very scarce resources efficiently, and I hope you'll prioritize some of these requests. Thank you for hearing from us today and for your consideration. Thank you very, very much, and thank you for the role that the Nas National Safety Council uh, plays uh, in, in, in looking at eliminating preventable deaths and injuries. This is an issue that's very uh, near and dear to my heart. There's one area that I will focus on in another sub, uh, subcommittee, which is in the agriculture sector of what happens with injuries with, with children, and the, and the U.S. has a very, very bad record uh, in that regard, and that's something that I would very much like to, to address. But just so that you know, I've, uh, what we have done as a committee is try to increase the funding for OSHA, for NIOSH um, uh, as well. And at the moment, uh, trying to uh, work with the administration on a, 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 a temporary standard uh, because of what's happened with COVID when we take a look at what's happened in the uh, meat packing, the poultry plants, uh, et cetera, and the, uh, the, the grave risk that people are uh, um, uh, uh, you know, are subject uh, to because we do not have a temporary, uh, uh, we don't have a temporary standard. Um, uh, so um, uh, I, you can be sure that I will pay attention to these uh, 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 priorities uh, because I, I think we have neglected these areas and the statistics uh, that you report about the number of people who either died or injured on the job um, um, uh, uh, is staggering uh, and oftentimes uh, without any penalties attached uh, to the um, uh, uh, to the almost, if you will, deliberate risk uh, that uh, that people are placed under. So thank you. Please understand that we'll take it all under consideration and uh, uh, look very closely at it. You're right about scarcer resources, um, but we will. Uh, look at where we put our priorities as well. So thank you so very much. And thank, thank you, Council. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Um, let me now introduce uh, uh, Robert Blancato, the National Association of Nutrition and Aging Services Programs. Mr. Blancato. Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, Congressman Molinar, thank you for this invitation to testify on FY22 funding for the Older Americans Act Nutrition Programs. First, let me offer sincere thanks for the $1.6 billion in funds this program received in four emergency pandemic bills. And Chair DeLauro, your leadership was pivotal on this. I come to do more than testify for a line item. I'm also making an appeal to allow a remarkable movement, which has helped millions of older adults in the pandemic, to continue. I am here with an ask. On behalf of both my association, NANASP, and our colleagues at Meals on Wheels America, we request a total of $1.9 billion for the Older Americans Act Nutrition Program. This exact funding level is also supported in a bipartisan letter co-authored by Reps Bonamici and Stefanik with more than 100 co-signers. But it's more than the money. This funding level would be a recognition and a reward to the National Nutrition and Aging Network that stepped up amazingly during the pandemic. They endured the largest change to the program in its 49 year history. It went from a program where twice as many older adults were in the congregate program to one where almost everyone got their meals at home or through drive through programs. This conversion happened virtually overnight, yet nationally nutrition providers rose to the occasion to ensure that older adults did not miss their daily meal. Support for this FY22 money is about saying to the field, a job well done, but a job not over. I can provide ample justification for the 1.9 billion. First, cost. The conversion of this program has meant higher food, transportation, and personnel costs. On transportation, programs went from serving hundreds a day in one location to getting meals to hundreds of, of individual locations. Meanwhile, gas prices have risen 49.6% in the past year. 
Second justification, greater demand. The emergency bills added important flexibility. Most impactful and updated definition of a homebound, allowing any older adult forced to shelter in place to be eligible for home delivered meals. This in a program which had waiting lists before the pandemic. A survey by Meals on Wheels America showed a 95% increase in demand in the early pandemic months. And today we still see a 60% increase in demand from the pre-pandemic period. A related and third justification, avoiding having older adults hit and fall over a funding cliff. This will happen when funding which allowed these new participants to join the program runs out. Many of these new participants will remain as clients well into FY22. The words of one area agency director in Arizona say it best, quote, I don't want to have to call people and say we're done with you now. These are our grandparents, unquote. A fourth justification, this funding will allow many creative and innovative partnerships between nutrition programs and restaurants, food delivery services, and dropship services to continue. Public-private partnerships are only as good as each side having resources to partner. A fifth justification, these funds help alleviate the three evils of hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition in older adults. Estimates show food insecurity rates have doubled since the start of the pandemic. We are especially fearful about malnutrition since before the pandemic, one in two older adults were at risk of malnutrition or were already malnourished. This daily meal can often be the main source of nutrition. If it's removed, that older adult may not eat at all. The next iteration of the dietary guidelines are to be focused on older adults. FY22 is a critical year for NIH to have sufficient funding to do needed research on older adults and nutrition. Also, this program is vital in the effort to address social isolation. In the pandemic, nutrition service providers made sure to establish programs to maintain contact with those they were now serving as homebound. These programs must be continued in FY22. Finally, building off the American Rescue Plan, we need continued funding to allow the aging network to assist in vaccination. We will enter flu and pneumonia season in FY22, and we need to be fully prepared. Two other points. It, we hope for flexibility in how these funds can be used to help in the safe reopening of congregate sites and senior centers during FY22. It will cost money to do that. We, along with the National Council on Aging, are surveying members on these costs. They are real and average about $15,000, which is money that is not in their budget. So some of these FY22 funds could be used to achieve, to achieve safe reopenings. And finally, I urge the subcommittee to urge ACL to make reporting of regular appropriations and emergency funding as simplified as possible. ACL has already done outstanding work supporting the nutrition network during this emergency and should be applauded. During FY22, the older Americans Black nutrition programs will turn 50. Their 49th year may have been their toughest, but the program more than survived. Let's give thanks to the dedicated nutrition service providers who once again, they proved that the interests of the older adults they serve are at the core of their mission. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you very, very much to a, a dear friend and someone who has uh, spent a professional career uh, really focused and dedicated to the issue of nutrition uh, and aging services. So uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Bob. Uh, for uh, for re really all of your all of your efforts uh, here, um, I, I think the United States is a land of plenty, um, and we don't have a shortage of food um, uh, like some other countries which have to import their food, and therefore uh, no one uh, should go hungry in the United States. Not a child, nor not nor an older American. And at the same time, we need to focus uh, on uh, both the hunger issue and the nutrition issue. Um, and I think uh, that we uh, uh, that uh, uh, that is uh, it's something that you know is again very near and dear to my heart um, in terms of, uh, of food. It's not food insecurity; it's hunger, and that we cannot tolerate that uh, here. And we also need to be very cognizant of the kind of isolation that you speak about. I think about that with the Meals on Wheels program and how imperative it is. My hope is is that we will have the resources to get those congregate. Uh, housing uh, that Congress get uh, 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 efforts open uh, so that people can go back because of the isolation um, and the lack of socialization. Uh, but be sure the area of nutrition and older Americans is uh, very, very high on my priority list. So thank you so much for being here this morning. And again, thank you for your great work. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. Uh, let me now uh, introduce Kevin Brown uh, for your testimony, Mr. Brown, from the SAFER Foundation. 
Thank you, Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify on behalf of the SAFER Foundation. My name is Kevin Brown, and I serve as the Director of Policy, Advocacy, and Legislative Affairs for the SAFER Foundation, a nonprofit reentry and workforce development organization headquartered in Chicago. For almost 50 years, SAFER has provided comprehensive workforce development and reentry services for individuals with criminal legal histories seeking employment. There's dignity in work, and SAFER Foundation believes that individuals who have made mistakes should have the opportunity to be self sufficient and contribute to their families and communities through gainful living wage employment. An important federal program that helps to support these efforts is the Reentry Employment Opportunities Program, RIO, with the Department of Labor, Employment and Training Administration. I want to thank the subcommittee for providing RIO with $100 million in FY21. This funding has helped organizations such as SAFER maintain access to services during COVID-19, especially as a demand for reentry and workforce development services increased. For fiscal year 22, I wanna urge the subcommittee to provide 125 million for Rio. With this increased funding, the Rio program would help address the urgent need to train people for the jobs our economy requires now in industries such as healthcare, technology, and logistics. The critical need to help employers identify the qualified workers they need to fill available positions and the important need to help people with criminal legal histories find living wage employment to support successful long-term reentry. You know, one in three adults in America has either an arrest or a conviction record. People with criminal legal histories face significant barriers to finding career path employment and achieving economic security. Structural racism and outdated policies for employment and licensure has blocked people with criminal records from entering a range of jobs and career paths. Increasing RIO funding would expand access to comprehensive workforce development, reentry services for the significant population, and it would provide a path towards economic equity. As a RIO grant recipient, SAFER employs a holistic approach to reentry, and this can include services such as job training and placement, education assistance, behavioral and health services and housing assistance. Through proven methods and individualized care, SAFER helps thrive people to thrive and work and build their lives that they want and need. An example of this is a story, a success story of a SAFER graduate named Charles who completed a RIO funded job training program in early 2019. With the RIO grant funding, SAFER was able to train and prepare Charles for a career in commercial driving. And at SAFER, Charles took classes on professionalism, customer service, and financial responsibility. And SAFER provided support for the trucking driving course through, through which Charles qualified for his CDL, including transportation to class. SAFER also provided Charles with a stipend while he took the class. And after Charles completed his training, SAFER was able to match him with an employer uh, who needed uh, CDL credentialed employees. And as a matter of course, SAFER works with employers to help them to identify and onboard skilled and credentialed workers they need to fill these open positions. Charles is, he loves his work, he's happily pursuing his career in commercial driving and enjoying people he meets and the economic opportunity he now has to move forward in his life. Finally, to help maintain the, the uh, national recovery economically from the COVID pandemic, um, employing qualified and skilled individuals with criminal, criminal legal histories who are one out of three adults in, in the US would help to fill critical workforce shortage and gaps. The RIO program supports employers in leveraging the entire talent pool our nation has to offer, which will help our economy recover more quickly and equitably. You know, given the extensive employment and reentry needs nationwide, the significant return on investment from reduced incarceration and crime costs and the need to make economic uh, opportunity more equitably available through our nation, 
I urge Congress to allocate $125 million to the Rio program in fiscal year 22. Thank you so much for your time and consideration of this important program and inviting me to testify today. Thank you very, very much. And thank you for the work of the Safer Foundation. It really is the saving foundation here uh, in, uh, uh, in, 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 in working with uh, folks who are formerly incarcerated and helping them to reenter uh, into society. And please understand on the subcommittee, you have tremendous support. Um, uh, you, you, you know what, I can say Congresswoman Lee uh, has been a, a champion in these, uh, these areas. Um, and uh, looking to ways in which we can, uh, in fact, um, um, what we tried to do, as you probably know, though it's not in, in effect yet, is to provide a Pell Grants uh, uh, to uh, folks who were, uh, you know, incarcerated so that we want to make sure. Um, but the wraparound services that you talk about are critical. And that is job, it's the housing, so the work with uh, employment and training. Uh, is 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 really so critical. So understand um, that uh, it is it is it is a high priority. We can't continue to leave people behind. Um, and I think we have a new opportunity uh, to to try to do this. There's a new understanding, if you yes. will, of of you you know uh, what we should take on and where our values are. So thank you so much. Thank uh, you. I appreciate all, all that you are doing in this area. It's so critically critically important. Um, Thanks. You know, uh, um, uh, and we, we may, may not implement this program, by the way, so that you know until the next academic year, but yes. understand we're keeping at it, okay? So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Um, if I can, let me now uh, introduce Catherine uh, Schubert uh, with the Society for Women's Health uh, Research. Chair DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, members of the subcommittee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify. My name is Katherine Schubert, and I'm President and CEO of the Society for Women's Health Research. SWHR was founded over 30 years ago to promote research on biological differences in disease and to improve women's health through science, policy, and education. Biological differences between women and men influence disease development, progression, and response to treatment, while social determinants of health, including gender, affect disease risk, healthcare access, and outcomes. The pandemic has exposed an array of health disparities and significant sex and gender differences. Men are more likely to develop severe complications and have a heightened risk of death, while women are more likely to experience longer-term symptoms and more adverse events following vaccination. From a societal perspective, women more often bear the burden of the role of caregiver, experiencing job or food insecurity and mental health concerns. Nevertheless, much of the ongoing COVID-19 research fails to thoroughly investigate the impact of sex and gender. Investment in women's health across the lifespan is critical to a successful and thriving society, and robust funding for agencies across HHS is essential to addressing these needs. Today, I will focus my testimony on the National Institutes of Health, and I urge the committee to provide at least $46.1 billion for the NIH, including funding increases for the Office of Research on Women's Health and the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. For decades, women were simply treated as smaller men um, with respect to research and scientific breakthroughs and were actively excluded as research subjects because of this misperception, which ignores the impact of both sex and gender on health. As the NIH focal point for coordinating women's health research, ORWH ensures that women are represented across NIH research and works to improve the representation of women in women's health within federally funded research. ORWH provides critical leadership to programs like the Specialized Centers of Research Excellence, which advances translational research on the role of sex differences in the health of women, and the IMPROVE initiative, which coordinates interdisciplinary research on factors impacting maternal mortality, a significant public health issue. To allow the ORWH to continue to coordinate these efforts and provide leadership on the impact of sex and gender differences across the NIH, we recommend $55.4 million for the ORWH in FY22. We also support an additional $3 million for the Building Interdisciplinary Research Careers in Women's Health Program, an initiative that trains investigators to research sex and gender influences on health. Additionally, the NICHD provides a home for women's health research, and we ask you to provide at least $1.7 billion for the NICHD in FY22. And I want to highlight two key areas of women's health research within the NICHD. 
the inclusion of pregnant and breastfeeding populations in research, and uterine fibroids. Nearly 94% of women take at least one medication during pregnancy, and 50% take at least one during the postpartum period, yet pregnant and lactating individuals are excluded from the majority of biomedical research. Consequently, these women and their healthcare providers do not have access to the information that they need to make confident decisions about their healthcare. We support the appropriate inclusion of these populations, and we thank the subcommittee for its continued support of the Federal Task Force on Research specific to pregnant women and lactating women, which is housed within the NICHD. Um, this task force has been crucial to outlining next steps for improving research in these population, and based on its 2020 report, um, we would like to see the NICHD work with the National Academies of Medicine to convene a panel with specific legal, ethical, regulatory, and policy experts to really look at a framework for addressing these issues. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about uterine fibroids, which is one of the most common yet underfunded gynecological conditions. Approximately 26 million people in the U.S. between the ages of 15 and 50 have fibroids, and 15 million experience symptoms like severe menstrual bleeding, anemia, impaired fertility, and pregnancy complications. And fibroids cost the healthcare system between six and $34 billion annually. Um, there are also significant health disparities that exist um, in fibroids prevalence, onset, and severity. Black women are two to three times more likely to develop fibroids than white women. They also tend to develop fibroids at earlier ages, develop more and larger tumors, and show increased symptom severity. And so we're asking the subcommittee to support the prioritization of funding to expand this research that will identify early diagnostic methods and fertility preserving, preserving treatments. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to highlight these areas of needs in women's health and your continued support of these issues. I look forward to working with you. I also challenge us all to think a little bit bigger and to engage in a multi-year cross-federal agency public-private collaborative initiative that will truly impact and improve women's health across the lifespan through research. And again, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very, very much. I'm so pleased to hear from you. Uh, today, I work with um, Dr. Carolyn Missouri, who is at the uh, uh, Yale Women's uh, Research Center uh, uh, over and over again. And um, I'm also wanting to move to deal with the uh, pregnant and lactating women and clinical trials in this area as well as if, if you laid out. And just so that you know, in, uh, in this current fiscal year 2021, um, uh, we added a specific line to the NIH funding the table for the office, a special separate line item for the Office of Research of Women's Health, funded at about $44 million. Um, so these are issues very important to me as a survivor of ovarian cancer. Um, and uh, so, uh, and, and also uh, in the Congress at a time um, when women uh, and minorities were not included in the clinical trials at the NIH, and we reversed that, but we still need to keep vigilant and always do, and it will be a significant part of our questioning when we see Dr. Uh, Collins and the other institutes um, uh, next week at the NIH hearing. So thank you. Thank you for outlining the issues, and you've given me a, um, uh, 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 you've, given, you've just given us a roadmap of where we should try to proceed and the kinds of questions that we ought to be a uh, as uh, asking uh, next next uh, next Ma week. Madam Chair. I, yes, yes. I also want to yield to my colleague from uh, Florida, Congresswoman Lois Frankel. Let, let me just say I'm into what you said just to uh, let Schubert, thank you. I'm, I'm, I will definitely be following up on your uh, testimony. And I yield back, Madam Chair. Okay, but well, thank you. Thank you. You see that you've got a, a, a you. real, real interest in this area. I, I, I you, you know, you can be assured of that. So, so thank you very, very much for your testimony. You, Take care. Right. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Mark Wolf, um, uh, who currently serves as the Executive Director of the National Energy uh, Assistance Directors Association, uh, a, a primary educational policy organization representing state low-income energy directors. And before joining NEADA, Mr. Wolf also worked at the Department of Treasury as a senior advisor in Budapest and Moscow. Before that, as the Deputy Director of the Coalition of Northeastern Governors, uh, which includes uh, my state of Connecticut. Thrilled to learn that he is also from New Haven, and he even had the privilege of knowing my mom, Louisa DeLauro. So it's a pleasure to have you join us today to talk about the challenges that families face in paying their home energy bills, 
how states use their LIHEAP funding as well as stimulus funding uh, to help families pay their utility bills and the adequacy of existing federal funds to address pandemic related um, uh, uh, arrearages as well as ongoing bills. So Mr. Wolf, please. The call. The ma oh, you're not on mute, okay. Uh, good morning, Chairman DeLauro, thank you Member Cole and members of the subcommittee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to test testify. I have to ask you, did you hear my introduction of yes. yours? Okay, yes. fine. I just, because I, 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 muting and unmuting is always a challenge for me, so. Right. It's, um, for my grandchildren, this all makes perfect sense. They live in this world, there's no challenge for them. Um, prior to my discussion about our request for FY22 funding for LAHEAP, I'd first like to provide the members of the subcommittee with a status update on electric and gas utility rearage rates for the millions of families who have fallen behind on their energy bills due to pandemic-related unemployment and underemployment. We're currently estimating that about one out of three low-income families owe approximately $30 billion from electric and gas bills. As the pandemic continued throughout the year, the state low-income home energy assistance program directors were increasingly concerned, frankly alarmed, that the nation will be facing record levels of utility shutoffs as utility moratoriums expired. In some instances, families who lost their jobs at the beginning of the pandemic were now up to $3,500 behind on the utility bills. Without help, these families would be forced to go on payment plans, the utilities putting them even further behind, keeping them in debt long after the pandemic ended. The families that have been hit hardest are working class families that are the backbone of our society. Last week, I got a call from Leo, the person who used to uh, clean our office. Uh, his, his business had collapsed. It had ended because of um, the moratoriums and because of um, uh, the shutdown in offices. They weren't able to pay their energy bills. Leo and his family, they're hardworking people. They shouldn't be in this situation. But thanks to the bold action by Congress, much to our, our, our happiness and pleasure, uh, we have enough money to help Leo as well as the millions of other families who are behind. The committee provided $5.4 billion in additional LAHEAP funding, along with $43 billion in rental assistance and $9.9 .9 billion in mortgage assistance that can go towards utility bills. The combined resources can help up to 15 million families. It's extraordinary. We were really concerned that we'd be facing almost a situation similar to the Great Depression. We'd be seeing millions of people without power or entering into onerous repayment plans. That won't happen this year. And it's amazing. We have enough money to help these families. We are concerned, however, about outreach and letting eligible families know that money's available. The biggest challenge is for working families who've never gotten welfare benefits before they don't realize that we're here to help them. We're trying to think through every possible way to do outreach. It's an extraordinary thing that Congress did. Between the rental assistance money and utility money, we can pay off their entire debt and then get back on their feet. It, it, it's just extraordinary. As the committee considers FY22 funding for LAHEAP, we're requesting 5.1 billion, the fully authorized level. That's up from our regular appropriation of 3.7 billion. What difference would additional money make? The FY22 regular appropriation was sufficient to serve about 5.9 million households, or about 16.7% of the eligible population. About 70% of these households have at least one vulnerable member who is elderly, disabled, or child under six. By providing 5.1 billion, we'd be able to serve 7.4 million households of about 20% of the eligible population. It would also allow us to increase the average grant about $525 to $560 and increase the purchasing power of the program about 55% of the cost of home heating to 60%. Energy prices fall hardest on poor families. The average energy burden for low-income families is about 17% of income, more than five times the rate for other households. And lastly, how does LAHEAP help families? We've asked families, what difference does the money make if you didn't have it? And they've said things that are heart-rendering. 37% would close off part of their homes. 25% would keep the heat inside an unsafe, or we believe an unhealthy level. 52% of the families that we asked, so they had a disabled member, 
many of whom now rely on electricity for breathing machines or to refrigerate medicine. And 17% would have to move in with a family or friend. Why, in many cases, goes beyond providing bill payment assistance by playing a crucial role in maintaining family stability and improving health outcomes for vulnerable populations. Enables elderly citizens to live independently, and ensures that young children have safe, warm homes to live in. Though the circumstances that lead each client to seek LAHIP assistance are different, LAHIP links these stories by enabling people to cope with difficult circumstances with dignity. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. I mean, I, I think um, one of the I think one of the ways in which the federal government has really made a contribution over the years is with the LIHEAP program. Uh, I think LIHEAP is is really so critical. I, you know, in in your, in your testimony where you point out we've all, you know, been in homes where you know people will keep the the gas on in in order to stay warm, or they, or they they put the towels um, by the doors or the windows to keep the to keep the cold uh, to keep the cold out um, or they don't heat their food to a proper temperature uh, so that um, uh, and, and so that that the serious health uh, repercussions uh, 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 you know in the in the absence of uh, of, of, of lie heap funding or or a serious um, lie heap funding so um, that my, my the, 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 I was interested in one thing that you said about outreach um, and looking at ways in which we have to let people know what is out there and what's available uh, to them. Some of our community action agencies uh, uh, do that and are real heroes uh, in, in that in that context. Um, but I, I think that um, th this is a program that uh, has um, it, it, its benefits are, are, are really uh, so consequential and it, it cannot be overstated. And uh, so, um, again, you, you can be sure that, um, you know, look, and these are, uh, we come from the Northeast, others do. And then you've also have the, uh, you know, places uh, where there is the very high temperatures, et cetera. So um, this is a program that serves the entire country. Uh, and that's the, we, the, na the way we need to, uh, that we need to, uh, to regard it. Uh, and so uh, you can be sure that we will uh, uh, pay specific attention to what happens with the LIHEAP program uh, going, uh, going forward, and especially in view of the pandemic and then the aftermath of the pandemic for people. So thank you very, very much for your testimony this morning. Really appreciate it and, re and appreciate the organization and all that you do in your advocacy. Thank you so much. Thank you. There's one, one thing I'd like to add is that um, in the next few months as we go forward, we were worried that families would end up with, with significant utility debt. And because of the funding that was provided by the committee, we now believe that in fact families will not, as they get back on their feet, be burdened with this debt. That yeah. the funding provided will be enough to help them get back mm -hmm. on their feet. So it's really quite an extraordinary achievement. And yeah. really, thank you. I, I think it really will make a, a, a significant difference to many well, of the families. Well, thank you. And that really points to the fact of what the federal role is when the challenges become so overwhelming uh, to people in their lives that the federal government does have to step in and, as you point out, make a difference. So thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Um, I'd now like to um, uh, welcome Kathleen. Uh, Kathleen Kennedy with the Association of Minority Health Professional Schools. Kathleen? Good morning, Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony, and thank you for your leadership in addressing challenges facing the health workforce, health disparities, and medically underserved communities. I am Dr. Kathleen Kennedy, Malcolm Ellington Professor of Health Disparities Research and Dean of the Xavier University of Louisiana College of Pharmacy. I also serve as the chair of the Association of Minority Health Profession Schools, or AMPS. AMPS is comprised of 12 historically black medical, dental, pharmacy, and veterinary schools in the United States, and was established in 1976 to promote a national minority health agenda by addressing the needs of the health workforce and improving health status in medically underserved communities. 
AMP's institutions have trained 50% of Black doctors and pharmacists and 75% of Black dentists and veterinarians in the nation. Speaking to you today against the backdrop of the continued COVID-19 pandemic, we have learned valuable lessons over the past year and a half, but we know that there's more work to be done. The pandemic has pulled back the curtain on what many of AMP's institutions know and work towards every day, the pitfalls and shortcomings of minority health. Given the recent deluge of media coverage surrounding this disheartening topic, the country is primed and ready to act in a meaningful way. Our funding recommendations are robust, ambitious, and bold because there has rightfully been discussion concerning the devastating effect of the pandemic on people of color and the need to prepare for any future pandemics. To be as clear as we can be, there must be more robust investment on minority health and health disparities. To achieve this, we know that it will require the steadfast leadership of health equity champions. We stand ready to work with you and your colleagues to facilitate these efforts. If the subcommittee wants to adequately address and work towards fixing health disparities, there must be increased investment in Title VII health professions training programs that are designed to ensure the nation is equipped with a health workforce that reflects the population it serves. These programs are some of the only federally funded programs that improve the supply, distribution, and diversity of the health workforce by supporting educational opportunities for minority and economically disadvantaged students. To better understand health disparities, we need to increase the investment in the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities and its related programs, such as the Research Center at Minority Institutions that assist minority schools in developing biomedical research infrastructure. And we need to reinvigorate the NIMHD's Research Endowment Program that allows institutions to build infrastructure and research into health disparities. The benefits of increasing diversity in health professions to reduce such disparities, disparities have been studied at length and are well understood by the medical community. The attention now is to identify the most effective and sustainable methods to achieve this diversity. While there are many national champ campaigns underway to increase diversity in all medical and health profession schools, it is imperative that we further recognize and leverage the public value of historically Black health profession schools. AMPS institutions have long been and remain committed to addressing health disparities in whatever way that we can, with an eye first and foremost toward the communities with the greatest need across our country. Ironically, as a result of our mission focus, the financial models of historically Black health profession schools are uniquely disadvantaged compared to most of their research intensive peer, peer institutions. Consequently, we are disproportionately dependent on the various health programs that support our core purpose. Madam Chair, the investment in health professions training programs, graduate programs in biomedical sciences and public and safety net providers is most cost effective than absorbing uncompensated care originating in minority and underserved communities. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear and speak before you today, and I'm happy to respond to any questions. Thank you very much. And I want to just applaud AMPS and uh, uh, you know what you said is, you know, 12 historically black medical, dental, pharmacy, and veterinary schools in the United States. But I think what the, you, you know what, in your testimony, when you talk about the mission, uh, and the mission is, has always been critical but as you pointed out, the mission today uh, is uh, even more important in this sense, because uh, what the pandemic has done uh, is to just uh, lay open and expose, uh, again, what we've known was there, that the health disparities, the economic disparities, uh, and while we fight the, uh, the, the virus, we need to fight the virus of injustice in this area, and particularly in health disparities, but your mission, um, you know, improving the health status of blacks and other minorities and people in underserved communities. Um, uh, the, the institutions and programs, um, uh, 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 you know, and, and strengthening programs throughout the country, but improving 
the representative representation of blacks and other minorities in the health professions. I think that is a singular focus uh, which you have had and it's now more important than ever uh, that you should have uh, for this and that we all need to use this moment um, in order to what I've called build the architecture for the future uh, in these uh, uh, in, 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 the, in, in this area uh, and to make sure uh, that we do have uh, the minority uh, health professionals that we need to address uh, all of the healthcare needs of minorities and others. It doesn't need to be just minorities, but but particularly we need to be now in underserved areas and move on those uh, on those racial disparities in our healthcare system. So thank you so much for your testimony. And understand, uh, you have a subcommittee that is uh, you, you you know uh, Barbara Lee and Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Roy Ballard and Congressman Bonnie Watson Coleman and uh, our ranking. Uh, ranking member, Mr. Cole, and uh, but uh, the subcommittee and a bipartisan way uh, is attuned to this issue. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me now introduce uh, Jose Munoz, uh, the Institute for Educational Leadership. Uh, Mr. Munoz. Good morning, Chairwoman Delaro and ranking member Cole and esteemed members of the subcommittee. I wanna Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Jose Munoz, as you heard. I'm currently serving as the interim director for the Institute of Educational Leadership, which over uh, half a century has cultivated and activated leadership for greater collaboration, just to prove the outcomes for students, families, and communities across America. Today, I'm coming to you today as the director of the Coalition for Community School, which is an alliance of hundreds of national, state, and local partners who advocate for community schools, for which I'm pleased to testify on our behalf. Our request today is to significantly increase the full service community schools program of the Every Student Succeeds Act to match the administration's budget request of $443 million. You know, coming through a pandemic, our country needs a coordinating strategy. I listened to the other programs, one that is efficient in leveraging our resources, uh, but also effective to address the compounding issues that our students, our families, and our communities are facing. Well, community schools are an evidence-based strategy proven to be effective uh, serving students and families, but also achieving the outcomes we all wanna see. Additionally, community schools are efficient. They're good stewards of individual, private, and public resources. Essentially, community schools are a strategy that coordinates the relationships and resources through a public schools to accelerate outcomes in health, education, and employment. Community schools have uh, proven to be effective. You know, in 2017, the Learning Policy Institute and the National Education Policy Center completed a review of nearly 200 studies of community schools and concluded that they meet the criteria for an evidence-based improvement strategy in the Every Student Succeeds Act. For example, our nation's largest community schools initiative in New York City has proven to be more effective in increasing graduation rates and student achievement and decreasing chronic absenteeism and disciplinary incidents quicker than the compared to demographically similar non-community schools. And in Cincinnati, a district-wide commitment for community schools has enabled the district to actually narrow the black and white achievement gap significantly over time. Now, community schools are also extremely efficient in the way that they're leveraging existing resources from the community to enhance the resources available in the school. A study from Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I came from, uh, shows that for every dollar that was invested in the salary of the key pillar of a community school, the coordinator saw over a $7 return on investment in the amount of resources that this role and strategy yields for the school and its children. With this type of effectiveness and efficiency, it's no wonder that uh, so many communities across the country just actually want to start and or scale community schools, yet our current demand far exceeds our ability to initiate, at least at first. This is where the full service community schools program is so important. This program has enabled dozens of hard strap communities to start and or sell community schools. Federal funding for community schools could and should prioritize the highest need schools and communities. So pre-pandemic, there are over 25,000 Title I schools with concentrations of students in poverty. Yet the program's current level of funding for full service community schools of $30 million was only able to fund 18 communities in 2020, which is a drop in a bucket compared to the needs and demand that uh, for a coordinating strategy like this, especially coming through a pandemic. 
So we have witnessed both before and during the pandemic uh, community, how community schools can transform not only student outcomes, but also meet the immediate needs and create new opportunities for families and communities that actually lead to greater economic mobility. Through the pandemic, uh, community schools were able to mobilize quickly and effectively to support the social, emotional, and physical learning needs of students and their families, like at Ganesha High School in Panoma, California, when one student's mother died from COVID and a father was on a ventilator. Staff and community partners of this community school dropped off groceries, connected the family to counseling, mobilized emergency aid to address the hospital bill so the family could stay in their home. The current level for full service community schools program is $30 million. It's just not significant enough to move us forward through this pandemic. So the president's budget request of 443 million is a big increase. However, because we know community schools are an effective and efficient strategy, particularly for our most vulnerable students and communities, I would argue that this both is a smart and just investment to ensure our students can receive the best education possible and that their families and their communities have support they need to get on track towards flourishing and that they can leverage. Uh, this session, Congress has also recognized the value of community schools through legislation for the Full Service Community Schools Expansion Act as well. So I just want to strongly urge uh, the request to uh, approve the 443 million president's budget. And on behalf of the Coalition of Community Schools, I want to thank you in advance uh, for your support of community schools, and we look forward to continuing your resource for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Munoz. And you should know I, uh, I taught at a community school in New Haven, Connecticut, the Dr. Harry Conte Community School. I'm a believer in them. That's why I put in the funding uh, to deal with full service community schools. Uh, these are schools that are open from early morning to um, late at night and included uh, teachers and children and parents and grandparents and uh, sporting events and uh, it's etc. So I really am a believer uh, in what they can do. I think it was uh, so, um, uh, you, you, you know, uh, such lack of vision uh, in um, in shutting community schools down when we did uh, have them in, in the past. And you mentioned the, um, uh, the, the what the president's budget is, which is an increase of about four hundred and thirteen million dollars. Uh, so it's 440 through, but so it's an increase in that regard. Uh, something that is, again, uh, near dear to my heart. I also taught um, um, modern dance and calligraphy in the, in the, in the, in the community school uh, there. So it was uh, right across the street from my house. And as a volunteer, I, I worked there. So um, uh, we will uh, continue to support and move with this, um, uh, this effort on really and at this time, making community schools an integral part of our education system. So thank you very, very much for your testimony. Thank really you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, with that, let me introduce Virgil uh, Rambo, uh, Council for Opportunity in Education. Virgil. Good morning. Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to testify today. My name is Virgil Rambo, and I am a member of the Walker River Paiute Tribe from Shores, Nevada. Currently, I reside in Sacramento, California. I am here today in support of a $219 million funding increase in the federal TRIO programs, which is administered by the Department of Education. I am a first-generation student. I was raised in a low-income single-parent household, which experienced substance abuse and mental health struggles. As a youth, I never had any dreams of becoming anything when I grew up. After graduating from high school, I made my first attempt at college when I enrolled at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. After two semesters, I stopped out to work. A few years later, I found myself at Chabot College in Hayward, California. I managed to keep pace with a full academic load and at least two waiter jobs. However, the need to earn money became a matter of survival. So again, I was forced to drop out of college. During this time of my life, my struggle with alcoholism began. Alcoholism, alcoholism cost me my job and housing, which resulted in homelessness. My days were dark and every day was worse than the one before. Over time, I started to have suicidal ideation and this scared me. I had reached out to my family in Nevada and they helped me to get back to the reservation, which is the start of my recovery. My sobriety date is June 11th, 2011. 
I restarted my academic journey through TRIO's Educational Opportunity Center in Las Vegas in 2009. It was here that I met Kyle Ethelbaugh. At that time, he was the director of University of Nevada, Las Vegas's Adult Educational Services Program. Unlike the more well-known TRIO programs like Upward Bound or Student Support Services, Educational Opportunity Centers help adults like me re-enter the education pipeline and successfully navigate the complex college admissions and financial aid processes. Kyle worked with me one-on-one -on -one to guide me through the first steps of completing the FAFSA and guided me on my journey to enrolling at the College of Southern Nevada. Kyle was one of the first Native American professionals that I had ever met. Like me, he was also from a first-generation low-income background. Kyle inspired me to support the Native American community. My academic success would not be possible without the combination of federal and state aid from various sources, along with tribal and non-tribal scholarships. Financial aid covered at least 80% of my academic expenses, primarily from the Pell Grant and state grant. Words cannot express how grateful I am for the financial aid that is provided to low-income students. It provided me with an amazing college experience. I developed strong interpersonal relationships with Native American and non-Native American students and professors. It also gave me an opportunity to make a difference in the lives of college students and community members via internships and participating on student committees. The, alma, the motto for my alma mater is redefine the possible. I believe that financial aid supported me with redefining the possible in my life. My academic journey started with one goal, which was to complete what I had started years ago at the community college level. In 2013, I graduated with a Social and Behavioral Sciences Associate in Arts from Sierra College in Rockland, California. In 2016, I graduated from the California State University, Sacramento, otherwise known as Sac State, with a Bachelor of Social Work and a minor in Native American Studies. My undergraduate program taught me how historical trauma impacts tribal communities throughout Indian country. In 2019, I graduated from Sac State with a Master of Social Work at the age of 43. My education strengthened my critical thinking skills and taught me to question everything. It also strengthened my resilience. Today, I am employed as an Associate Clinical Social Worker at the Sacramento Native American Health Center, where I provide mental health services to American Indian and Alaska Native youth between the ages of 10 and 24 and their families. In my current position, I'm accruing hours towards licensure so I can meet my next goal, to become a licensed clinical social worker. I would not be where I am today without the academic, financial, social, and cultural resources that were provided to me as an undergraduate and graduate student. Although I made many attempts, it was TRIO that finally put me on the path to achieving my academic goals. While, tri while TRIO is only able to serve a fraction of first-generation low-income students who are eligible for services, I was one of the lucky ones. It is my hope that as a result of my testimony today, the subcommittee will answer the calls of many throughout Congress to double or even triple TRIO funding. Because of TRIO, today my narrative is one of hope and inspiration. Today, every day is better than the one before. Thank you. Thank you. Your testimony is one of hope and inspiration. And thank you. Thank you for coming and telling us your story. Uh, there is, uh, uh, quite honestly, um, Virgil, there isn't, there aren't any words that I have. You, you, you said it all. Um, that uh, the, the trio, uh, a remarkable, remarkable program, and it is something that I might add is shared by both sides of the aisle on, on this on, on this subcommittee. We believe in it. It is, um, uh, it really is a lifeline uh, for people, as you have so eloquently um, described, and um, uh, the, also the effort for with Pell grants. Uh, and the and the educational assistance that we can provide uh, to students, uh, this uh, changes people's lives, and it it it, it really um, it, you know it is all about education. Quite honestly, being be, being the great equalizer in our nation, um, and that the opportunity for that education is is so critical. And really, no one has described it as well as you have uh, in in your testimony this morning. So please be assured um, that. Uh, a trio is a, uh, 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 you know, and, and its future and the strength of its future is of uh, unbelievable importance uh, to this uh, to, to this subcommittee. And I, 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 you, you are really paying back as well in your current position and providing the kinds of help 
uh, and services that youngsters uh, today need so that th they can fulfill their dreams and their aspirations in the same way that you have been able to do that. So thank you so, so much for your testimony this morning. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Amalia Chamorro, Unidos US. Thank you. Uh, good morning or afternoon. My name is Amalia Chamorro, and I'm the Director of Education Policy for Unidos US, previously known as National Council of La Raza, the nation's largest Hispanic civil rights and advocacy organization. As an immigrant and naturalized US citizen, a Latina and English learner, I'm very honored and humbled to represent an organization that has built a stronger country by creating opportunities for Latinos for more than 50 years. I would like to thank Chairwoman Rosa DeLauro and Ranking Member Tom Cole for inviting me to participate in this hearing to share our education funding priorities. The face of our next generation of leaders is changing. Latino students make up one in four students in our public school system, and there are nearly 5 million English learners, ELs, enrolled in our schools, with nearly 75% whose home language is Spanish. Latino students have experienced a disproportionate impact in the wake of the pandemic. During the past year of largely remote learning, one in three Latino households lacked high-speed internet, challenging Latino student learning and language development for ELs. Students and their families also face the highest cost of college in history, and the economic crisis contributed to a first decline in a decade for Latino undergraduate enrollment. It dropped up 6% compared to 1.7 growth in fall 2019. These inequities undermine the ideal of education as the great equalizer of our society. Therefore, Unidos US respectfully makes the following request for federal funding. Invest in English learners. EELs make up 10% of K-12 public school students in the US. And federal data shows the number of EELs grew 28% from 2000 to 2017. Title III of the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, is the federal formula grant program intended to support EELs in every state and territory. Funding has been relatively flat, however, since its inception, fluctuating between $664 million in 2002 and $797 million in FY21, the highest funding level appropriated to date, yet this breaks down to only $159 per EL student. And when adjusting for inflation, Title III funding has actually decreased by 12.3% since 2010. Last week, Unidos US and the National Association for Bilingual Education, NABE, circulated a letter to Congress that was also signed by 120 partner organizations requesting $2 billion for Title III. Increasing funding support for ELs would make for a smart investment. According to a congressionally requested report from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences Commission on Language Learning, as a country, the United States needs bilingual and biliterate citizens for national security and to promote economic growth. Support higher education. Higher education is one of the surest pathways to economic and social mobility, but it remains out of reach for too many students who are Latino, are the first in their families to attend college, and come from low-income backgrounds. Over the past decade, Hispanic college enrollment rate among 18 to 24-year-old high school student graduates increased 10%, and yet just 55% of Latinos complete a degree within six years compared to 64% of their white peers. To ensure that the post-secondary system better meets the needs of Latino students, Unidos U.S. urges Congress to do the following. Double the maximum federal Pell Grant to $12,990. Almost half of Latino college students receive Pell. This increase would help to restore the purchasing power to half the cost of college for a BA degree at an in-state public institution. Increase degree attainment by investing in academic and comprehensive support programs, such as $1.2 billion for TRIO, 400 million for gaining early awareness and readiness for undergraduate programs, gear up, 50 million for the high school equivalency program, HEP, and the college assistance migrant program, CAMP. Our research shows that these programs help keep students enrolled by providing academic, social, and emotional guidance and mentoring. Provide 350 million for the Developing Hispanic Serving Institutions, DHSI program, which helps Hispanic Serving Institutions, HSIs, expand educational opportunities for Latino students. HSIs make up 18% of all institutions of higher education, and yet they enroll 67% of Latino undergraduate students. And finally, invest 100 million for teacher quality partnership grants. 
Research suggests that students' performance can be positively impacted by a more diverse workforce. More than half of public K-12 students are students of color, but nearly 80% of their teacher workforce is white. The largest demographic mismatch exists between Latino students and teachers, with more than a quarter of students being Latino compared to only 9% of teachers. In conclusion, I thank you for this opportunity to present our appropriation request. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. And, uh, uh, you know, my congratulations to you on directing the education policy and, um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, spent a lot of time working, you know, with the organization when it was the National Council, you know, so, but under, you, you know, and, and, and still do, but thank you. Uh, you've laid out some areas that I've already spoken about a bit. Look, the TRIO program is a serious commitment uh, to uh, continuing to uh, increase that as well as gear up and the migrant program uh, as, as, as well. Um, uh, I know you what your request is, and I can't give you specifics because we don't have the full budget yet, but you do know that there was $791 million in English learners uh, program um, uh, this, uh, for this fiscal year. And we are moving to, uh, to try to increase uh, the amount of the Pell Grant. Uh, as I said before, we're going to try to get the Pell Grant up to, uh, well, it, it's $6,495, but we're looking at a way in which we can continue to increase the size of the, uh, of, of the Pell Grant. Um, uh, I, I think uh, yourself and the, and the, um, uh, some of the other uh, witnesses today, the, the issue that, um, our, our Native American friend who was with us, Virgil, a moment ago. Uh, the, the issue of education um, is is really critically important, uh, and we have uh, known and, and uh, we've known, and now there's been a, a much of more of a light shown on the disparities that have existed um, uh, in minority communities, and whether that is a health or education or the the economy, and therefore. Um, uh, I think, uh, not I think, we are of the view that this is the moment uh, where we should look at how we can turn that around, use it as a building block, uh, if you will, uh, in terms of the architecture for the future and provide that educational opportunity that all youngsters uh, deserve and provide them with the qualified teachers uh, and not have those, those schools that come from the uh, maybe highest poverty areas uh, have the teachers who are less prepared to teach uh, children. It just shouldn't be that way. And so I think uh, we are very, very acutely aware of having to address those issues. So many, many thanks uh, to you, Amalia, for really for being here today and, and for the work that you're doing um, continuously. So I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, recognize Laurie Fogarty, the Oakland Museum of California, on behalf of the American Alliance of Museums. Laurie. Thank you. Chairman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to submit this testimony. My name is Laurie Fogarty. I am the Director and CEO of the Oakland Museum of California, OMCA, testifying on behalf of the American Alliance of Museums. I urge you to provide the Office of Museum Services, OMS, within the Institute of Museum and Library Services with $80 million for fiscal year 22, an increase of nearly $40 million. IMLS is the primary federal agency responsible for helping museums connect people to information and ideas. Its Office of Museum, and, uh, museum Services supports all types of museums, from art museums to zoos by awarding grants that help them better serve their communities. Museums are economic engines and job creators. According to Museums as Economic Engines, a national uh, report, pre-pandemic US museums supported more than 726,000 jobs and contributed 50 billion to the US economy per year. For example, the total financial impact that museums have on the economy in the state of Connecticut is 834 million, including 10,000 229 jobs. For Oklahoma, it is a $405 million impact, supporting 6,400 jobs. 
In fiscal 20, OMS received 784 applications requesting nearly 146 million, but current funding has allowed the agency to fund only a small fraction of the highly rated grant applications it receives. $80 million would allow OMS to double its grant capacity for museums, funds which museums will need to help recover from the pandemic and continue to serve their communities. For the Oakland Museum, as with other museums, the COVID-19 health crisis and resulting closure have had a significant and very difficult impact. Despite these enormous challenges, museums for months have safely served as community centers for education, inspiration, and even for vaccines themselves. Our museum closed its doors to the staff and public as of March 13th, 2020, and we remain closed with a planned reopening date of June 11th. To date, the Oakland Museum has lost approximately $3.8 million in gross earned revenue through the end of March 21, and anticipates an additional approximately 3.3 million in total revenue losses in the coming year. As a result, we have had to reduce our staffing by 15%, and we know that recovery will be a multi-year process. Despite the heavy economic toll, the museum continued to serve our community, jumping into the digital realm like never before. We offered virtual field trips for school children and virtual community celebrations online this year, uh, including producing virtual versions of our beloved annual Day of the Dead and Lunar New Year celebrations. Further, as a founding partner of the coalition known as Art for the Movement, we partnered with the Black Cultural Zone and Oakland Art Murmur to document, steward, and preserve the hundreds of street murals that were created in Oakland during the racial justice protests of the summer of 2020. Now, as we look forward to our reopening, we know that more than ever, museums can and will be safe places for community gathering, places where communities and people can come together to rebuild trust, understanding, and connection. For OMCA, as with other museums, additional OMS funding at this time would provide essential and urgently needed support. I want to express the museum field's gratitude for the 40.5 million in funding for OMS in fiscal 21. And we applaud the 151 bipartisan representatives who recently wrote to you in support of fiscal 22 OMS funding. This small program provides a vital investment. In closing, I highlight recent national public opinion polling that shows that 95% of voters would approve of lawmakers who acted to support museums and 96% want federal funding for museums to be maintained or increased. Museums have a profound positive impact on society. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very, very much. And I think you said it well when you said this is a small program, with it's a, 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 vital, a vital investment. And I, I think it's, it's true would that we would emulate some of our European counterparts uh, that these are you know, state funded and, uh, you know, very, very well taken care of. You are a center of, of uh, our communities, et cetera, and, and, and clearly have provided that, uh, uh, that effort during this, uh, this pandemic. And so, so glad because people, museums are beginning to, to, re, to reopen. And I, I, often, I just think about um, this is part of our, uh, our, our, our arts humanities um, uh, you know, uh, history, um, and I think that, uh, uh, and, and you pointed up some of the economic benefits and talked about my state of, of, of Connecticut, and my, my view is if you can't get them on the humanity, let's get them on the economics of the program and how important they are. So please understand, uh, realize the, the tremendous um, uh, a contribution uh, that museums make, and I want you also to know that my uh, my colleague David Price uh, from North Carolina is a very, very strong uh, an advocate uh, for these efforts, and I'm sure he will be doing the same as we move to craft the appropriations bill, um, you know, coming up for 2022. Thank you so much, and thank you for what you do. Thank you, and want to extend a special thanks to Cong Congresswoman Barbara Lee as well for her strong support. So thank okay. you. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I'll pass that on to the Congresswoman. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Take care. Bye. Uh, Nicholas Lewis, Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman Delero, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee. 
My name is Nicholas Lewis, and I currently serve as a council member for the Lummi Nation, the chairman of the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, and the vice chairman of the National Indian Health Board. I want to thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to provide testimony on the fiscal 2022 Department of Health and Human Services budget. COVID-19 has impacted all of our lives, and it is forever changed, but we are grateful for the diligent work and leadership of our congressional representatives ensuring that our tribal governments have access to federal and state resources to battle this pandemic. We ask the subcommittee to honor the trust and treaty obligations by rebuilding and repairing the foundations that is needed to improve our Indian health system. Because many of our people live in rural areas or lack transportation, telehealth has bridged our people to healthcare. CMS telehealth temporary flexibilities have made available during the pandemic must be made permanent and also expanded to ensure that healthcare reaches everyone. COVID-19 has demonstrated the underinvestment made by the federal government in public health and medical care infrastructure in the Indian health system. The system is underfunded and lacks capacity to respond effectively to public health emergencies like COVID-19. We request 1 billion for a CDC Tribal Public Health Emergency Fund established through the Secretary of HHS that tribes can access directly for tribally declared public health emergencies. For the Good Health and Wellness and in Indian Country Initiative, we recommend funding at 32 million. The initiative is important in cultural and traditional ways of subsistence and provides a foundation for physical nutritional health in our communities. For HIV and hepatitis C, CDC prevention and education generally flows to states via block grants. This leaves many tribes with limited or no resources and forces tribes to compete with states for funding. For 2022, we recommend a set aside of 25 million for HIV and HCV prevention in Indian country. In addition, we recommend that this subcommittee provide 15 million tribal set aside through the Office of the Secretary Minority HIV AIDS Fund. This fund is the only HHS funding source that includes funding to IHS for HIV and hepatitis C prevention, treatment, outreach, and education. I really want to take a moment to also talk about our Native youth. They are the future of our people and they are the future leaders in our community and the future carriers of our traditions and cultures. We want to ensure that they have all the services that they need to grow and develop into the future leaders for our tribes and our people. Our tribes have prioritized the need for culturally tailored and comprehensive mental health and substance use services. This must include transitional housing. Housing is fundamental because it helps reconnect our youth to their communities and their people. We recommend 25 million in funding for youth specific outpatient and inpatient mental health and substance use programs with transitional housing. As to SAMHSA funding, we thank you for the 2021 increases in tribal specific programs. For 2022, we request the following increases for these programs. Fund the Behavioral Health Grant Program at 50 million. This funding is critical as we manage the long-term impacts of COVID-19. Fund the Garrett Lee Smith Suicide Prevention Tribal Set-Aside at 3.5 million. Fund the Zero Prevention Initiative at 3 million. And fund the National Child Traumatic Stress Initiative Tribal Set-Aside at 1.5 million. Tribal opiate response funding has allowed our tribes to develop programs to address this crisis with positive outcomes. For example, the Lummi Nation has brought on success coaches for those using our in recovery and it is working. We request an increase in tribal opiate response funding at 75 million and an increase in the tribal MAP funding at 20 million. In closing, we ask this subcommittee to support tribal set-asides and move away from competitive grant funding for tribes across HHS and its agencies. Funding must be allocated to tribes through 
Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act, Compacts and Contracts. On behalf of Northwest Tribes, I want to thank you for your time and consideration for these recommendations, and we welcome your call at any time to discuss any of these recommendations and look forward to meeting with you in person soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much uh, for, for your testimony. And uh, I, 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 someone who years ago um, uh, helped uh, author the National Traumatic Stress uh, Network, um, I'm very I'm pleased to hear that one, uh, that you think that it is worthwhile and it's doing its job and that we ought to increase funding for it. I too always look for increased funding. Uh, but you've laid out an array of, of, of programs that I think are real significance uh, to uh, uh, tribal organizations. Um, and uh, I think what we've tried to do over the last uh, year, year and a half is uh, with, um, with all of the recovery programs, the relief programs, the CARES packages, all of that is really to do a set aside uh, for tribal organizations uh, and, and, and so forth. I understand that a lot of the programs are block grant uh, 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 programs, but I think we have um, uh, you know, cognizant of, of, of the need to really carve out a set aside. Uh, for some of these uh, for some of these efforts, thank you for the work that you're doing on Indian health and pointing out um, the issues that are uh, that 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 are, that are uh, uppermost uh, when you you know, talk about AIDS and some of the other areas and the opioid use, etc. Um, it's very critical for us uh, to uh, uh, to to understand where the priorities need to be. So let me just say uh, a thank you. Uh, to you and we too are, are concerned and you know that Congressman Cole, uh, who could not be with us uh, this morning, uh, you, you know where his sentiments are uh, and how strongly an advocate he is uh, for uh, for Indian health and for tribal organizations. So uh, together we will uh, work to see about uh, helping to continue to make a difference uh, for uh, our tribal organizations and our Native American communities. So thank you again. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. I have Joanne Pike with the Alzheimer's Association and the Alzheimer's Impact Movement. Ms. Pike. Good afternoon, Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today and for your leadership. I want to acknowledge I have submitted my disclosures per the committee's instructions. Recent increases in Alzheimer's and other dementia research funding at the National Institutes of Health has accelerated breakthrough science and allowed us to envision a new phase in Alzheimer's care. One where for the first time, we have the benefit of significant new Alzheimer's treatments. For those who have advocated for increased Alzheimer's research funding year after year, including those currently participating in our advocacy forum this week, you have given them hope. Hope that one day we will realize our vision of a world without Alzheimer's and all other dementia. However, we must address Alzheimer's not only as an aging issue, but as an urgent and growing public health threat as well. Alzheimer's public health funding at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is crucial to ensure a strong public health foundation in communities across the country. On behalf of our nationwide network of advocates, including my own family, we are grateful to you for being strong, effective champions for Alzheimer's activities at the NIH and CDC. Millions of Americans will live profoundly better lives because of what this subcommittee and Congress has already invested. We can never thank you enough for that. As many on this subcommittee know, Alzheimer's is a progressive brain disease that causes a slow decline in memory, thinking and reasoning skills. Alzheimer's is fatal. It continues to be the only one of the top 10 causes of death in America without a way to cure, prevent, or even slow its progression. We have yet to celebrate the first survivor of this devastating disease. While recent NIH funding increases have enabled significant advances in understanding the complexities of Alzheimer's, there is still much left to be done. Investment in Alzheimer's research is still only a fraction of what's been applied over time to address other major diseases. We therefore urge Congress to support an additional 289 million for NIH Alzheimer's research funding in FY 2022. We need to continue to increase investment in Alzheimer's and dementia research 
in order to maximize every opportunity for success. With every study, we are finding another piece of the Alzheimer's research puzzle. We cannot leave any stone unturned. While researchers pursue a treatment, we must also help the millions of families currently affected by the disease and continue to grow our ability to understand risk reduction. Investing in a nationwide Alzheimer's public health response will create population level change, achieve a higher quality of life for those impacted, and help bring down costs. Now more than ever, it is apparent how crucial it is to have an established foundation in place to respond to public health threats. We thank Congress for prioritizing Alzheimer's as a public health threat through the swift enactment of the bipartisan Bold Infrastructure for Alzheimer's Act in 2018. This law authorizes 100 million over five years for the CDC to build a robust Alzheimer's public health infrastructure across the country. The 10 million Congress appropriated for the first year of bold, impl bold implementation in fiscal year 2020 allowed CDC to award funding to three public health centers of excellence focused on risk reduction, caregiving, and early detection, and also 16 public health departments across the country. These states, local, and tribal public health department recipients are creating statewide dementia coalitions, hiring dementia coordinators, and developing or updating Alzheimer's and other dementia strategic plans. The 15 million appropriated in fiscal year 2021 will help fund additional public health departments and expand the impact of this crucial work into more communities across the country. The Alzheimer's Association is grateful to be leading the Dementia Risk Reduction Public Health Center of Excellence. Researchers are increasingly studying the impact that lifestyle behaviors may have on the risk of developing Alzheimer's and other dementia. Over 65% of American adults have at least one risk factor for dementia. The future of redu reducing Alzheimer's could be in treating the whole person with a combination of drugs, modifiable risk factor interventions as we do now with heart disease. The Center of Excellence on Risk Reduction allows us to take the research we learn on lifestyle and risk reduction and turn that into actionable activities in all communities. While these bold implementation efforts are important steps forward, and we are grateful to this subcommittee and Congress for the initial funding, we urge Congress to include the full 20 million authorized in the law for bold impl implementation at CDC in FY 2022. This would enable CDC to award additional public health centers of excellence, focused on important priorities like tribal health and avoiding preventable hospitalizations, and expand the number of state, local, and tribal public health departments across the country that receive funding for Alzheimer's public health activities. We are in a moment of possibilities thanks to each of you. And beyond critical funding, you have offered hope to millions of Americans. The Alzheimer's community is tremendously grateful for your leadership, but we can't afford to stop here. Please continue to lead. Lead us to a world without Alzheimer's and all other dementia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, hang on. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony and your passionate testimony. Uh, I think you, you know that there is a commitment uh, to addressing the issue of Alzheimer's and, uh, and, <clears throat> And uh, I foresee that that will that will continue. Thank you for laying out the directions in which you think uh, that we 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 ought to that we ought to move. Um, and uh, you know uh, clearly this is uh, a, uh, a, a a very singular focus that we've had for the last several years, uh, and that will uh, that will continue. So thank you so very much for your testimony. Thank um, you, again, Chairwoman yeah. Deloro. We look forward to con continuing to work with you and members of the subcommittee. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Uh, now I, I would like to offer a very warm welcome to a former resident of Connecticut, Brian Wallach. He is the co-founder of IMALS and received his bachelor's degree from Yale University. A few years ago, while Mr. Wallach was working as an assistant U.S. attorney, he was diagnosed with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. He was just 37 years old. Refusing to let this shocking diagnosis deter him, uh, Mr. Wallach partnered with his wife, Sandra, who was a New Haven townie like myself, to co-found IMALS, which is a nonprofit organization that provides critical support and resources to ALS patients, caregivers, and loved ones while engaging with policymakers, promoting ALS research, and mobilizing communities to take action. 
So far, the organization has mobilized more than 60,000 people in the ALS community and has spread increased awareness of ALS to millions of people. Mr. Wallach is a force and an inspiration, and we are so delighted to have him today along with Sandra. Uh, he will be discussing funding for ALS research programs and new initiatives that will accelerate development of therapies for all life-threatening neurodegenerative diseases. Welcome to you, Brian, and to you, Sandra. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, um, for the um, amazing introduction and for the opportunity to testify before you again today. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Brian Mark. Um, I'm joined by my wife, Sandra. And I have asked her to join me in testifying today. Um, as ALS has ravaged my voice. Two years ago, I sat before this committee and asked you to see us, hear us, and to fully fund the fight to defeat ALS. Thank you. Thank you to you and other key leaders. Because of you, we have increased federal spending on ALS research by 83 million in just two years. You saw us. The question now is how quickly we can end ALS and whether any of us living in ALS today will see that day. I come to you today with two urgent requests. First, to fund ARPA-H and to ensure that ARPA-H includes ALS. Despite President Biden's promise to Adi Barkin, the administration's request left ALS out of the list of diseases ARPA-H would target. You have the power to fix this by putting ALS back into ARPA-H. Second, to hold the FAA accountable for its fair to attack ALS and the flexibility and urgency it promised us. In September of 2019, FDA released an updated guidance for ALS clinical trials. It stressed the need for, quote, regulatory flexibility and explicitly stated that, quote, when making regulatory decisions about drugs to treat ALS, FDA will consider patient tolerance for risk and the serious and life-threatening nature of ALS. The first test of FDA came this year when two ALS therapies, AMX 0035 and Neuron. FDA's response was no approval, no regulatory flexibility. Instead, FDA asked for another large, long, placebo-controlled trial for each therapy. Let me make crystal clear what this means. At best, these therapies now won't be accessible to patients for four years. By then, nearly every ALS patient alive today will be dead. This is nearly impossible to comprehend when AMX0035 appears headed towards approvals in Canada and Europe based on the very same data presented to FDA. And it is particularly egregious given that thousands and thousands of patients and caregivers have signed petitions to the FDA pleading for access to these therapies. I truly believe that they is well with all the more delicate public servants. However, their actions here are impossible to square with their own guidance. I implore Congress to hold hearings to bring transparency and accountability to a process that has left the ALS community devastated. FDA's actions have provided Congress a clarion call to reform how FDA regulates treatments for ALS. In a disease that is 100% fatal, how is it that we don't fast track therapies to people living with ALS now? I ask you to pass and fund two bipartisan bills to ensure this does not happen again. Act for ALS and the Promising Pathways Act. 
The fight against COVID-19 showed how much regulatory flexibility FDA has when it wants to use it. And today, science is finally producing therapies that may be able to slow or stop this disease. This reality must be matched by a new regulatory approach that speeds promising therapies to ALS patients. It is our obligation to change the current broken system for all those facing ALS, just as we have for HIV and cancer. If we do, I will have a chance to see my young brothers grow up. You have the power to make that happen. I thank you for having the courage to do so. Uh, what can I say to the two of you? Thank you for your courage. And let's hope that your courage gives all those here the courage to move forward. We will make clear that ALS is part of the ARPA-H uh, effort. Um, and as we had to, and thank you for your tenacity, for your courage, for your pushing every day in order for us to be able to at least move the FDA to some semblance of, of, of understanding and humanity to the situation. Uh, the stark comment you make about four years from now, those who are alive today will be dead which case we can't wait we can't wait you cannot wait your family cannot wait and those who are afflicted as you are brian um deserve deserve more you deserve to have a fighting chance that is all you are asking us for is a fighting chance um and um we're going to do our damnedest to give you that fighting chance. Because as you speak about, you know, and you say, Brian, I am ALS. And you say that as well, Sandra, we are all ALS. We need all of us to impact this disease, which is ravaging. And so um, without, without today a cure. And uh, we, we have risen to this occasion before in the face of illness. We need to rise again to this occasion. And I can't tell you how grateful I am uh, to um, know you and to derive strength and courage from, from both of you in um, what, uh, what I do. I'll be personal about that. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I will do everything that I can uh, to see that we address those two areas um, that you so have eloquently described. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Godspeed. We will be in touch. Take care, you and your family. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> let me now uh, ask Laura Thomas, who is with the, uh, the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, the Director of Harm Reduction Policy. Laura, oh, let me just say a word or two about you, Laura, if I might. Um, uh, you have lived in California. Uh, for some time now, but it's my understanding that you received your bachelor's degree at Wesleyan, which is in Middletown, Connecticut, uh, which I represent. So um, uh, you can appreciate the value of Connecticut schools. But since then, you've received two master's degrees in public health, public policy from University of California at Berkeley, advocating uh, on HIV and public health issues in San Francisco for over 30 years. Wonderful to have you here with us today uh, to, to really 
uh, respond to the U.S. overdose crisis, supporting harm reduction and syringe services programs through the infections, diseases, and the opioid epidemic program at the CDC and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Laura, please, your testimony. Thank you, Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and other members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. Uh, my name is Laura Thomas, and I serve as the Director of Harm Reduction Policy at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. I'm submitting testimony today on behalf of the San Francisco AIDS Foundation and a large national coalition of public health, HIV, viral hepatitis, and harm reduction organizations. We urge Congress to save lives by supporting and expanding access to syringe services programs by allocating $120 million for the infectious diseases and opioid epidemic program at the CDC. The U.S. must more effectively address the overdose epidemic that has dramatically increased over the past year. In 2020, it's likely that more than 100,000 people died of overdose, a 40% increase over the previous record year of 2019. Drug overdoses are now the leading cause of accidental death in the United States. We must also urgently address the racial disparities in overdose deaths. From 2015 to 2018, overdose deaths increased 2.2 times among African Americans, 1.7 times among Latinx people, and 1.3 times among white non-Latinx people. California's overdose death rates are even worse. In 2019, there were 6,400 overdose deaths in California and over 10,500 deaths last year, a 63% increase. San Francisco lost over 700 people to drug overdose in 2020, more than twice as many people who died of COVID-19 here last year, more overdose deaths than COVID deaths in San Francisco. In San Francisco, black people are dying from overdose at over four times the rate of their white counterparts. The infectious diseases associated with injection drug use have also dramatically increased. Since 2010, the number of new hepatitis C infections has increased by 380%. Outbreaks of viral hepatitis and HIV among people who inject drugs continue to occur nationwide, primarily in places without sufficient access to syringe services. Over 30 years of scientific studies show that syringe services programs reduce overdose deaths and disease transmission, and increase access to substance use disorder treatment. They do not increase drug use or crime and they save money. Hepatitis C treatment can cost more than $30,000, while HIV treatment can cost more than half a million dollars per person. Expanding access to these services will help avert many cases, saving millions of dollars in a single year. At San Francisco AIDS Foundation, we know this firsthand. For nearly four decades, we have promoted health, wellness, and social justice for communities most affected by HIV. Our syringe services program reaches over 18,000 people per year, and our staff build relationships with participants, the foundation upon which change can be built. We connect people who use drugs to a comprehensive range of medical services, including hepatitis C and HIV testing, sexual health screenings, on-site hepatitis C treatment, HIV care, medication-assisted treatment, counseling, harm reduction-based group interventions, and substance use treatment counseling. Programs like ours are an effective way to get naloxone, the drug which reverses an opioid overdose, into the hands of people who use drugs and are most likely to be present when a friend or loved one overdoses. Last year, our team distributed more than 36,000 doses of naloxone and nearly 4,000 overdose reversals were reported back to us. With additional research resources, we could reach more people with naloxone, which would help reduce the number of overdose deaths. Unfortunately, this, this nation has insufficient access to syringe services, and the COVID-19 pandemic has decreased access to these life-saving services during a time when the need has so dramatically increased. San Francisco AIDS Foundation just had to lay off valued members of our syringe services team, and this is true for other programs nationwide. I was a syringe access volunteer starting in 1998, long before I took this job. I have seen firsthand the impact that these essential services can have. And I've also lost far too many friends and colleagues to overdose in that time. On behalf of all of the people I love who use drugs, I encourage Congress to respond to this crisis 
by providing $120 million to fully fund the CDC Infectious Diseases and Opioid Epidemic Program in FY22. Thank you for your time and consideration of my testimony today. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony and the work of the, of, of, of the, of, of the foundation. And a staggering thing that you said is that, was it the deaths from o overdose um, outpaced the deaths from COVID? Um, in San Francisco last San Francisco. year, yes. Yeah, that, that's, that, that really is extraordinary. And um, uh, I think it's, so, you know, I'm from, from New Haven, Connecticut, and uh, where syringe services, I mean, we were pioneers in that, in, in that effort. So I'm a strong believer and, and strong supporter of, 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 of that effort. And we should take a very hard look at that. But the, the opportunity for you to, um, uh, re, you know, I mean, it, it's about reducing the rate of infectious diseases, which is what you're talking about. And, and then, um, uh, and, and, you know, uh, then we can deal with some of the the, the other pieces, whether it is, you know, alcohol abuse or mental health or any kinds of treatment that, that people, uh, that, that people need. So, um, we, we need to, um, uh, uh, really, um, take a hard look at the, the data with regard to the syringe exchange network, um, and use that as a foundation, uh, and information, uh, so that we can, uh, work to, Look at how we can increase that, that that you know that funding. Obviously, it depends on the amount of funding that we get and so forth. And I know you know that, uh, but this is a proven a, a program. And so, any information that you may have uh, in this regard of of laying out, uh, it's, uh, it's it, you know uh, how effective it is would be would be very helpful. So thank you, thank you so much, uh, you, you know, for for your testimony um, and. Uh, uh, and and for all of the the uh, the efforts uh, that that you are making, because in fact you are saving lives, and we don't have any more noble cause that we could be engaged in. And let us help you do it. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank good. you, thank, thank you for your support. Thank you. Uh, let let me introduce Rachel De Spain, uh, who is the Head Start and Early Heart Head Start director with the Tri-County Opportunities Council. Good afternoon. My name is Rachel Despain, and I am the proud director of the Tri-County Opportunities Council Early Head Start and Head Start Program, providing support and service to 633 children, families, and pregnant mothers throughout nine rural counties in Northwest Illinois. Today, I will be speaking about the unique opportunity Congress has to support the children, families, and employees of Head Start programs throughout the nation. A bit of my story. I was born and raised in Mount Carroll, Illinois. 1,700 people reside in my hometown. Beloved small communities such as mine often offer little in terms of economic opportunities, but we certainly have big hearts. Some leave for college, others join the armed forces, and some, like my mother, stick around. For me, that new opportunity was college, whereas my dad was en route to Vietnam. Dad returned home after his service to our country to marry my mom, and I returned home too. But that wasn't the plan. I was to be a single mom and had to suspend college. Due to the good fortune of two loving parents, I had help in raising my son, while still, by most measures, a child myself. Soon after Keegan was born, I went to work for the TCOC as an assistant teacher, often working weekends at a nearby golf resort. The income from these two jobs allowed me to financially provide for my son, but I was reliant on state-assisted healthcare. With family support, I resumed local college classes, and without the steady presence, security, and assistance of my parents, I surely wouldn't be here speaking with you today, and I certainly wouldn't have a master's degree or be leading an organization that I love. I speak of my experience to help shed light on the significant challenges of so many. Far too often, parents today, or a single parent, as is often the case, lack the traditional support like the support that I had and can only rely on dynamic programs like Head Start. Frequently, when support systems do exist, struggles of persistent poverty, stagnant wages, college debt, ever rising health care, and other economic hurdles stifle growth. Breaking even becomes a long term goal whereas getting to tomorrow is a more pressing aspiration. 
These are obstacles faced by the men, women, and children TCOC serves, and by many employed by our program. Nearly 25% of TCOC program staff are at or below the federal poverty guidelines for a family of four. In order to provide consistency to families in need, we must stabilize the Head Start workforce. My staff often find themselves with a desire and love for the work, but struggling to find affordable childcare or forced to find jobs outside of Head Start. Many carry agency-sponsored health insurance for themselves, but are unable to afford it for their family. My staff shoulders the weight of their own stories and the stories of their kiddos. The $247 million in additional workforce investment that the National Head Start Association is recommending will provide more attractive wages and impact the mental and financial health of our staff. And as a program director, this actually reduces costs by enabling me to keep well-trained, qualified staff. Second, we've long known that the experience of stress is unique to the individual, but what we are starting to better understand is the long-standing impact trauma has on the healthy development of children. Adverse childhood experiences affect brain development. It changes cognitive function, such as memory, reasoning, attention, language development, and problem solving. Skills children need to find success in forming lasting reciprocal relationships with children and adults. The population we serve experience continuous changes in living arrangements, demanding newly formed relationships each and every time. TCOC is often the constant. The $363 million in quality improvement funding we seek will allow Head Start programs to enhance supportive learning environments, offer continued professional development opportunities from experts in the field of trauma, and sustain mindful, compassion-based approaches that strengthen child resiliency and offer hope. Finally, one way that we can disrupt poverty, educate children, empower families, and strengthen communities is by extending the duration of service hours. Expanded Head Start contact hours with children presents greater opportunities for parents to seek full-time employment, apply for promotions, and continue their education. Furthermore, it provides three healthy meals a day for children and built upon our focus on physical, dental, and mental health of those we serve by elongating the time spent in a stress-free environment. Extending hours of instruction will lead to long-lasting, collaborative relationships with the children's most important teacher, their parent. All said, critical funding needs remain, but I know this subcommittee has been a long-standing champion for Head Start. As a partner to NHSA and the Illinois Head Start Association, I ask uh, for total funding in $12.1 billion, which represents a truly impactful and program-altering increase in fiscal year 22 to address these very real concerns. Thank you. So, son, congratulations uh, to you. How was your son? He is he is wonderful. He is is certainly my greatest accomplishment. Thank you so much for asking. Uh, absolutely, thank you. No, you've accomplished quite a you know quite a lot, and uh, 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 and your advocacy for Head Start for early Head Start near and dear to my heart. And I think you know that we did about ten point seven five billion dollars in Head Start. It's one of the largest increases in Head Start. Uh, understand uh, the 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 value of it, and you should know as well as a uh, founder of Head Start, Dr. Ed Ziegler, um, uh, is from New Haven, Connecticut, and who I had the opportunity to work with for for so uh, for so many uh, so many years. Uh, and I think you 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 are right about um, uh, early Head Start and what we know about children uh, and the development uh, of their brain development and. Uh, and so forth, so that these are, are critical issues. Uh, and um, uh, the, um, you know, and you're looking at the, the, you know, the president talking about universal pre-K, et cetera. So there is significant focus and understanding of the role that Head Start, early childhood education, uh, these efforts, what they mean to the future of our kids, uh, uh, you know, go, going forward. Uh, so you have willing partners uh, in this effort, my dear. Um, and uh, so let me just say a thank you to you. And I want to also thank you for your patience uh, in waiting, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to make your presentation, but an excellent one. Uh, and we certainly will take into, uh, very seriously take into consideration of the direction and the path you want to take us on. So uh, really many, many, many thanks to you. And uh, I appreciate it. Uh, 
very, very much. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you uh, so much. And you be and well. Thank your folks. Thank your folks. All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you Thanks. so much. Take care. Right. Um, and with that, I will just say this uh, 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 to you, my dear, that it's uh, you are the last witness of the day. We've had 23, uh, all of which with extraordinary stories um, and uh, where we can go. We're all looking, you know, where the budget can take us, et cetera. But please know um, that uh, uh, we have listened and listened very, very carefully and want to uh, heed um, uh, the, the advice that you're giving us. Uh, and uh, try to make that path to uh, uh, to uh, to achieve as close to success as we can in these areas. So thank you all very, very much. And with that, I'm going to uh, call this uh, a committee hearing adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.